Yeah. Okay. One minute, guys. One minute, guys. Here we go. Let's have a good show. Uh, what well, these stand by. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. Okay. Get at midfield so so right now. Go to well, camera three. Yeah. Okay. One minute, guys. One minute, guys. Here we go. Let's have a good show. One well, stand by. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. Okay. So, get at midfield so, so, right now. So, go to well, camera three. Three. Can you go to the game? Perfect. Thank just you. like that. I'll just go ahead. Yeah, graphics two is gonna be up for the first game. Okay. I'll just go ahead. Yeah, graphics two is thirty out. No music. I'm gonna hatch back. One minute, guys. One minute, guys. Here we go. Let's have a good show. One minute. Okay, and go for it, guys. All right, all right, all right. Hello, everybody. Hello, Canal Zone. Happy Friday. Welcome Happy to the Friday. UYC. Ricky, welcome. Good to see you again. Welcome. Yeah, welcome back to our podcast, everybody. You know, Willie and I, both born and raised in the Canal Zone, Panama, both actually feeling a little blessed to bring you guys, our audience, a little, little bit of our history of our beloved Canal Zone and the Canal Zone way. Willie, we got a great, great show lined up. We got a couple of good coaches, some players, and a little no, bit cheap. I think everybody's going to be happy to hear. Yeah, no, that's doing? something people look forward to is the bochinche. You know, we always uh, welcome everybody's comments, questions. Remember, both on Facebook and YouTube, go ahead and throw your comments in there, and we'll get you online, say hello to, to the zone, say hello to our special guest. Um, but, yeah, listen, we got a really, really cool show. And uh, first off, I want to thank everybody that's been watching the show. We've got a lot of repeat uh, audience members that are mentioning us. They're they're helping spread the show out and, and they're getting involved and commenting on it. So I, I really, really appreciate all that. We want to help grow this channel and and keep remembering and preserving the the, the memories of, of the U.S. And, and of the Canal Zone and, and, and of all of us here in the U.S. and in Panama. You know, we've got a growing audience down there as well. Um, a lot of members of the audience now are joining us from, you know, the, the different military bases from Fort Clayton and, and Howard Air Force Base. So uh, welcome all of you guys. We love having you guys out here. And and so yeah, and everybody on YouTube. Thank you. Thank you. Willie, we got like 33 subscribers. That's, wow. I'm impressed. There. Uh, so anybody there, right? out there, you know, if you're on YouTube, hit that subscribe button. It really, really, really helps a lot. It really does. Absolutely. And you get notified, right? We've got, I, you see that I scheduled a bunch of shows last night I and um, did you see the end of it? I put instead of, you know, Friday night, happy hour at the Balboa Yacht Club for that July 3rd weekend, that reunion weekend is reunion week. And we're going to be broadcasting from the reunion. Ricky's making the trek all the way from the West Coast. And uh, so we're going to have a lot of fun with that, guys. We're going to, you know, bring to the rest of the world that didn't show up show you what you're missing and make sure that you you get involved to, yeah we're you gonna know? try to get all the events you know we'll be at all the events that we can get uh yeah. access to uh but yeah so we'll bring we'll bring uh we'll bring the reunion to all you guys yeah for sure you know the reunion is is, is a big part of 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 this zonian history and everything but that being said nothing really makes up for it like uh the Panama Canal Society Right. And uh, next week, Laura's going to be on. Uh, she's going to spend some time next week talking about quite a few things in reunion and, and so forth. But we always got to give love to the society. That's what's keeping this Canal Zone story going. Right. We're, we're doing our little part here. But uh, these guys have been around for years. They've been doing a lot of hard work. They, they, they do a lot of great things to keep us all in the loop. Uh, a lot of retirees from the zone, they keep them informed on different legislative actions, different things that impact them, you know, and. And they keep yeah. us all together and not just in July. There's there's functions all year round. Uh, there's several of them that, that Ricky, you talk about, you know, yeah. in, your, in your Bochicha segment on the record. But stay involved with the society, guys. Uh, please uh, get your membership up, updated. Remember that uh, president or the governor's club is uh, it's a really good deal uh, on, on society membership. But, you know, like keep these years, guys going right? because they keep it's five years, five, five years. Oof. Yeah, it's fantastic. Yeah. So, um, but uh, like I said, next week, Laura will be on. Uh, if you guys want to join us and, 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 and ask questions of the society, you know, and, 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 
and whatnot. Um, she'll be on spending quite a bit of time, you know, talking to you guys and keeping everybody up informed with, with what's going on there. So, but, um, with that being said, Ricky, what's going on in the Bochincha world? You know, today's Bochincha is going to be coming from Panama, but everything is going to be related to the canal zone one way or another. Okay. So we'll start, uh, we found out that the Balboa Academy, which is the teachers from the Balboa high school, that started a school in Clayton and they kind of had the BHS format and, and they've done a great job for, you know, since 2000, I guess, right. When the, when DODS left and went over to Panama, they started that. So it's still going strong, but they're now moving out of Clayton. All right. Then they, they're moving down to a place called Costa del Sur, which is down there by Costa del Este. So it's on the way to the airport. And that's kind of like what we spoke about a couple of weeks back about the linear layout of Panama. You know, we keep going linear. We can't go into the canal. So even though a lot of the, you know, that's why the, you know, Albrecht is so full now and Clayton is getting full and all these towns just because that's the natural way to grow. So we know that, that uh, the Academy is leaving Clayton, but at the same time, they built this ginormous hospital out there. I don't know what this call maybe it's called uh, the hospital city or something like that but it's really a ginormous hospital facility you know i don't know they're i know they're almost open or they're open with only half of it or something like that but they're they're getting there and that's something really really big for the you know for all of panama especially the metropolitan people so clayton yeah. you know, clayton guys remember it used to be our military base uh, and, and a very nice base, too, if, I, if you guys remember. Well, Clayton now is like a high-end homes where you have really good urban planning, right? Clayton is now it's known as La Ciudad del Saber. In other words, there's a lot of universities there. And city of the, Knowledge. Yeah, oh, the City of Knowledge, correct. One of the universities there is Florida State, right? Florida State, huh? one of the zonians that are, actually his father is going to be on tonight, is the I believe he's the athletic director of Florida State, which is in Clayton. Oh, right on. Yeah, and then in my in my in my alley, they have a school there called uh, the School of the Isthmus, and that's where architects get trained now in Panama. And they also have a design school there. So those two universities, I think there's others, but those are two really good universities that I wanted to mention. Um, For those of you who don't know, Ricky is the art vandalay of. Uh, the canal zone with his architecture. Right yeah. So also out there, you have the U.S. <laughs> Embassy and in uh, Clayton, and I guess a couple of high schools. I think Javier or La Salle put a, a, a campus out there, as well wow. as that that fancy a girl school, Maria Immaculada. I think they have a campus mm -hmm. out there. So Clayton has become, you know, a hospital city, a, a university city, an education city, the U.S. Embassy. So our you know, Panama has done a very, very good job with how they utilize our our our, our one and only Fort Clayton. You know, right. too bad the cow. Well, the great infrastructure those last years. years. Yeah. Now, one thing I'm wondering. They now, just don't know how to line the fields. That's all. They, 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 right, they right, did right. good at football. They did all that stuff. But apparently, they don't understand the difference between line chalk? and chalk. Right, yeah. Right. So that's a story yeah. for another day on the Rams. But yeah. Yeah, another day. Maybe our Panama folks can let us know. But I think. Eventually going to build a highway out to Clayton because, you know, they have all these great facilities. Imagine. And they still have the old Canal Zone roads. You know, I mean, they got to they gotta make those bigger, in my opinion. But anyway, the second thing. Down the Canal Zone road, roads like that. Yeah. So the what first. Was on the Canal Zone roads. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, our roads were well built. Well, too. I mean, they're Same. still there. Because we built most of our roads really concrete. We rarely had asphalt roads. You know, they spent the money and put the good stuff down. Right on. That's very true. Well, we anyways, moving see on. Cracks and potholes. Migration's also in the in the news. You know, okay. Panama is where the there's a big crisis with this migration thing. You know, and that's in the news. And this kind of goes back to our last week Fort Sherman thing. You know, I mean, they got to get control of that. You know what, though, there is a zonian that can help us out with that. Who has? I, I mean, now I know he's retired, but had a lot to do with something or the other with this migration control. Eddie Dolan. He was actually a neighbor of mine. He lived right behind me. 
and our ex football mm -hmm. player too, Rams, and I'm sure he played it. You know, we Bowen don't have any of them these ready. days. Yeah, we we should probably bring him on. He's a good guy, very good guy. His dad, police officer too, with mm -hmm. our dads. Yeah, yep. yeah. So that that's kind of the 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 second thing on our boat change. I don't want to put too much because that's kind of a downer. But I like to talk about it with Eddie. You know, one day if we can get him on and see, you know, what's going on and you know how this is being handled. Another big thing on the Bochinche list, Willie, is Panama is now in election season. May yeah, right 5th. On the corner. Right around the corner, man. May 5th, they have elections. And they have right now four guys that are that 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 could win. No, now based on the polls that I've read, Mulino who used to be like the secretary of defense, but, you know, we don't have a defense in Panama, but he was in charge. I got the police and planning and, you know, how to, how to, how to deal with, you know, crime and all that stuff. He is now running for president and he's leading in the polls. And then after him are three guys that are basically tied. One of them is Martin Torrijos, which was a president in the past. And, and, you know, he's running again, you know, he's, he's doing quite well. Another one has a lot to do with our football uh, history. Romulo Root, one of the yeah. better quarterbacks that ever came out of the Kiwani Coats, played you know hard football with uh, against the Rams against Paul Myers. He competed against Paul Myers. Those two went battle to battle. Well, he's also running. And then the 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 third guy that's in that tie, but it's actually the fourth candidate, is this guy named Lombana. Now. I believe he went to Bobo High School because my brother, my little brother, Reynaldo, played baseball with him, you know, like in our, our ballparks. Wow. So, he, yeah, he's got a, he's got something to do with either Panamanian that went to the Canal Zone School or a Zonian that went to the Canal Zone School or, you know, something in there. But he kind of comes in as a, 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 a an independent, and he seems to have, like I said, he's t tied, like a three-way tie for second place. But Molino seems to have the, the lead. In a pretty good lead, okay. yeah. Mm -hmm. So that's what we got going on with uh, with with that part of our Bochinch election. And the final part, sports, something I want to throw out, uh, bring up, is if you guys remember on the way to the beach, there was that campana, right? And you go up the hill, and then mm -hmm. on the way down, there was that phenomenal panoramic view. You remember that? Well, yeah. If there, if you look down, there was like this swamp area down there. Remember that, yeah. or like Everglades, or something. Well, they put a, 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 a lot of coconut a, trees down there. What is? There was a lot of coconut trees out there in that area. Yeah, you're right. You're right. Palm trees and all that stuff. You can see them. It was a beautiful, beautiful view. Beautiful yeah. scenic view. Well, they put a racetrack out there, and it's and they have this. They call it the Autodromo. And if you guys remember back when we were growing up, Albrook races. Remember those Albrook races? I don't mm -hmm. know. If you guys yeah, but they kind of started when I was a. Uh, Teran, he was my classmate. His dad raced down there. Yeah, yeah. Oh, oh, yo, Teran's your uncle. That guy was good when I was a kid. Sure he was, was. Like a champion. He he raced yeah, Puma. sure. Pumas, right? That Brazilian car, Puma or something. I like believe that. so. I believe so. Yeah. Well, they those guys in Panama. I think this is privately built too. They have this new racetrack, and if you guys that, have that's what you saw it. Yeah, I saw. it. I saw that. And if you guys have played video games, you know that one category, GT Challenge Series, which is all the eight-cylinder, mm -hmm. you know, Porsche, yeah, yeah, yeah. And Corvettes, and all that. Well, that series is going to that track this weekend, right? And so, you know, they're going to have, you know, riders from all over the place because the money is big. Yeah, and one of the guys that's a, a favorite in Panama, somebody I hung out with my senior year when I was hanging out with Sven Wage, if you guys remember him, was this mm -hmm. guy named Soli Betesh. Good, good guy, good friend of mine, good friend of us. He's kind of like the the lead, uh, the guy that uh, represents Panama. Like he's got the fastest car. So Autodromo. Did he have a younger brother? I think so. Remember the Betesh, yeah. that that that, yeah. that fashion store, th that family. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So, okay. Right on. So yeah, like, younger brother's like, a friend of ours. Yeah, like they they've stepped up from the Albrook races to this fancy, you know, right maybe not F one, but damn it, it's F one for us. So that's sure. really really awesome news about Panama. So moving right along, Willie, really, because we got a couple of good coaches on that are are ready to talk some history with us. 
you know, maybe we all let you take over now and tell us what you have in mind. Yeah, no, absolutely. But uh, before we do that, though, I want to uh, give some love out there to some some friends of the show and uh, and showcase a couple of things there, and then definitely bring on our, our special guest, one of them uh, from halfway around the world. Uh, and I just saw that we also have a viewer from uh, halfway around the world as well. So really, really excited to, about to talk about that. But a couple of things, guys. Um, Al Sprague Art. Okay, remember Cassie was on our show back early on when we first started. Uh, Panama Art, exactly. Go to their website. They have a sale that goes until the 16th of April. It's right around the corner. Today's the 12th. So you have, so maybe Monday, Tuesday. Make sure you go there and, and pick some of that stuff up. That's some some iconic art. It's all Canal Zone. Everything about that is just nothing but love for Panama on the Zone. So make sure you take advantage of that of that opportunity. Some good pricing on there. Um, also, I, I saw the other day on the, on the Panama Net Canal Society uh, Facebook page, um, a posting uh, regarding Mr. Dragson, uh, who was, you know, in the zone, very well known, um, an unfortunate during Just Cause. He, he was an unfortunate victim of that. Um, but uh, it looks like Carl Dragson was was asking for information on 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 his dad and, and whatnot. And if anybody had anything uh, that they wanted to share. So. Uh, when you get a chance, go on there and look for that posting and, and, and maybe reach out to him if you have something, because that's I, I think that would be pretty cool to, to share whatever memories or stories you may have of him to, to share with him for about his dad. So um, anyhow, um, moving along, last week we had a really, really great show. Uh, Jerry Curtis was on, uh, shared a lot of really cool stories about, you know, racing in the zone, educated me on quite a few things and whatnot and he's got a really awesome program going on in panama right now and so there's the website on, on on the screen there uh they just put the website up so if you you know go ahead and give them a little bit of love there as well and if you know anybody that's in the motor motocross or really off-roading now because like you said this isn't any more just motorcycles but go on there and take a look at it because it, it looks like an awesome program we're gonna have to figure out a way to to find a budget at uh happy hour at the byc to see if we can get ourselves down at a Absolutely. To, to watch one of those. But, uh, but it looks good. You get to see places of Panama that you, nobody else gets to see. I yeah, mean, very few sure. people, should I say. Very few people, not just nobody. Yep, absolutely. No, it looks like an awesome, awesome time, and it's, it's a great program. So check out that website. Give them some love. And and then uh, one, of our, uh, one of our first sponsors, and in fact, our very first sponsor, uh, Andrew Eptomitis with Las Cascadas. We want to go ahead and give those guys – some love here as well uh because uh again he's he's was the first one to step up and say hey let me support these guys so uh. there you go so thank you to andrew for for helping us out and, and helping the show out there so uh, lots of love to you and everybody. If you guys want to go there, it's an awesome bed and breakfast. Where's it located? Behind the police station, in a sense, right? Make that road and where you would turn just past the police station. Make that right. Was that uh, was that Empire Street? Wasn't it? I believe it was called. I think so. Adam Mitch back in the day when it was his own. I don't know what it's called now. Toastins. Yeah, yeah. I think it's where the Toastins used to live. Okay. It's the okay. Same where the Toastins live. The Bacas used to live there. Remember Professor Baca? He, they used to live yeah. back there. One no, of it looks like a really cool place, man. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so check it out there. If you guys are going to Panama, make sure you stay there. A lot of cool things. And then he's got, of course, those boats, and he can take you out to the islands, to the canal, and all that stuff. Yeah, um, yeah for sure. So, again, Andrew, thank you so much for supporting the show, and we're more than happy to support you. Um, a couple well, of weeks ago, we had. He's actually coming back pretty soon, right? The update is on the canal. Yeah. The can What's going on yeah, on the canal? Yeah. The Panama Canal Report. He is our official Panama Canal reporter, and he's given us all the ins and outs of the canal. So uh, definitely stay stay tuned for more of that. Um, but now, uh, switching gears real quick. A uh, couple weeks ago, we had Don Stock on uh, personal one heart two countries, and and I, I went ahead and bought the book, and I talked about it briefly here, but. Um, Quite foolishly, I didn't even mention the name of the book. So, uh, personal one heart, two countries. It's a good read, guys. I started reading it. I really, it's, 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 it is a very, very good read, guys. It's again for us Zonians, it's super easy 
to to get yourself immersed in the book and understand everything that's going on there because yeah, it's one hundred percent relatable. Yeah, everything. We know, places, we know everything. We, exactly. Exactly. We don't even have to worry about using if our we imagination there, to tell a story. We were there. Yeah. When you read the book, we sure. the book you sure. feel like you're there. Exactly. Exactly. So um, so that's that's cool. Thank you again, Don, for, for coming on the show. We'll bring you on again. And Don, we'll be at the reunion, guys. So if you don't have a chance to go on uh, Amazon looking for the book there, at the reunion, he'll be there and he'd be happy to sign the book for you. So, uh, you know, again, much love to you, Don, for that. Um, now, another thing we're going to start doing, and I'm hoping we can get this going in the next week or two on our next few episodes. Um, Want to have a little bit more fun with uh, with our crowd out there, with our audience. We have a lot of people that are constantly, you know, participating and chatting with us, saying hello and, and whatnot. And we want to get more people involved. Uh, so one of the things that we want to do, guys, is uh, we're going to do a family feud style show. OK. This is a uh, groups of four, teams of four. And what we're looking for is graduating classes. All right. So if, if anybody wants to join, get a couple of, of your, your uh, classmates from your graduating class, either BHS or CHS, and, and come on here. It's all based on, on Panama stuff and Panama uh, stories, information, favorites, et cetera. Uh, but it's going to be a lot of fun, guys. We, Ricky and I have been working on this for a couple of weeks behind the scenes, throwing some stuff together. That's going to be it's going to be a lot of fun. So uh, but we need some of you guys to join up. So uh, reach out to us on the show. Uh, go on to uh, SCN Canal Zone, uh, Facebook dot com slash SCN Canal Zone and uh, send us a message in there or send me a message directly on Facebook. You can find Ricky on Instagram. Uh, you can also if you want on the Facebook here. And I know Ricky's going to get mad at me for this, but y'all go in and put a Put a chat in there and tell Ricky to get, get back on Facebook. But anyway, um, that being said, um, that's where we're at with a couple of fun things here. Let's go ahead and bring on our special wait, wait, guest. Wait, wait, wait. wait. I, want to, I want to see what Lynn, Lynn you remember? <laughs> Speaking of books, Our Man in Panama. Is that your, I, I think that's what she's talking about. That's another very good book. But that's, uh, yeah, that's also on the invasion. Uh, but it was. I did read that book, and I actually have it. I have it right behind me back there somewhere. And uh, uh, great book. It is a great book. And I do uh, uh, recommend that book, guys. As well cool. as well our, our, our former guests. Right on. Right on. We'll definitely uh, we'll read that book after you read Don's book. Okay. Yeah. Again, it's, it's, a, it's a good book and, and so forth. So anyhow, so let's go ahead and switch gears I now, guys. Because, again, we've been, tr you know, uh, we've been doing a lot of stuff with the with the Balboa Rams, and and there, of course there's that Rams reunion, which I'm, I'm glad I brought that up because I forgot to, to to mention that. Don't forget July 5th, 4:30 at the reunion at the in the hospitality suites. The Balboa Rams are going to have a reunion there. Uh, it's going to be a great time. Uh, look for some announcements in the Canal Record in June. There'll be an ad for that as well, talking about it. And of course, they'll be on here again in, in maybe next week or the week after. Well, we uh, got to talk Paul, about it. We got Paul Williams yeah. coming on, and he'll and he can he's a seventy six guy, and he has uh, a big reunion. I think it's her forty fifth or twenty fifth. Uh, and anyway, so they have a big Ram reunion as well as their forty fifth <laughs> reunion. So we're gonna have him on a little bit later here, or very soon actually. And he'll let us know what's going on with that and a little history on the Rams as well. And a lot, a lot of football history. Paul has uh, been competitive at that sport from a very young age. One of the guys that I looked up to. And uh, one of my first podcasts, we spoke of, uh, you know, what inspired us to play football, right? Well, Paul Williams was one of those guys that would show up with his, you know, his equipment and everything at the gym and everybody, you know, the best battle ball player. And then he would go to, Ram practice and yeah, Come that's on. all. We well, want to be like that, you know. Paul, Paul, get us on the team. So we're gonna have so, him on tonight. So when I hear battle ball, I think of Balboa Elementary, the gym there. And you remember school. on the side of the walls there, you had the, you had remember you had the recessed area that you'd sit. Benches, little benches. Yes, and so we would sit there with the ball behind our back. And you just wait and wait, and someone wait comes running one by. And, that was new. Yeah, man, you go and blast yeah, them. Man. That one kid, <laughs> if you remember, man. That's how you learn sure. not to go up to the line. Yeah, you know, not looking to your left and to your right. You know, you that's exactly right. 
Yeah, yeah. yeah, you know, and that you know what that in a sense built up some football skills for us, man. You had that that awareness, you, you know, head on a swivel. Play battle ball. You had to be really yeah. tough to play battle ball. Uh, but we also played against all the others, all the other uh, towns like Los Rios, Diablo, yeah. Gamboa. Yeah, I mean those those games were brutal, man, because we those were for blood. Well, you know, and maybe we'll do one of those feud shows like we had talked about before, right? A, a Diablo against. Ancon or a Gambo against Balboa and you know pit one neighborhood against another like we did back then so but anyhow that's that's for another time I digress on that stuff again guys if you want to get in get a get your your classmates from your graduating class get three of your friends and and four against four and let's see who's the best who's got the the best class the best Panama knowledge and whatnot. Yeah, and and we're building up quite the questionnaire too so we'll have some good yes uh, we are. There's some good questions for everybody. Some challenging Indeed. canal zone questions. Yeah, it's gonna be a lot of fun, man. So we're gonna draw um, too. Right? Have to draw. Yeah, that's gonna be one of them. That, we're not gonna give you guys too much right now, but uh, just know that it's not all trivia and knowledge. There's gonna be some other, some other fun stuff where we're gonna even get the audience to to be able to you know vote on things and critique. You know what? What yeah, people it'll are presenting. It'll so. be more engaging. It's gonna be fun. All the time. It's just gonna be a lot of fun. Like a and for what it's worth, show. yeah. <laughs> well, you know, hey, we've gone two and a half hours and nobody complains. So, um, Balbo Trading Company will help us out. Uh, Panama Arts, uh, Al Sprague Art, they're gonna help us out. Uh, Carlos Hadava, I talked to him. He'll donate some shirts. He's got some cool shirts. He's always offering over at the uh, at the reunion. He's one of the vendors there that I see every year. So he said he'd be happy to throw in some shirts as well. So. Winning team, you're going to get some really, really cool Canal Zone swag for doing this. And again, just have a lot of fun reliving the Canal Zone memory. So, but now enough digressing. Let's go ahead and get our guest of honor from a million miles away. Um, maybe not so far, but uh, it is, it's far enough that it's morning time over there. Okay. So, where we're. Yes, exactly. It's already tomorrow over there. So they're they're on the thirteenth. It's Friday the twelfth here, Saturday the thirteenth, all the way in sunny Okinawa, Japan. I was talking to Coach Bales last night, and it was cool watching. He's out in his backyard, and he he showed me. Look, man, and and you see palm trees and coconut trees and everything. I'm like, wow, this is great, man. This is another Panama all over again. You know, I feel like so. That. Yeah, but uh, anyhow, um, we were going to get. Four coaches on. Um, it's not that I didn't deliver on on the promise, but um, for technical issues, we're still trying to get a couple of the other coaches on. If they join us, great. If not, though, Coach Bales is here to share a lot of the history he has here. A couple of unique stories that, that him and I chatted about last night. That uh, you know, some some historical things and and whatnot. And also standing by as as an audible. You never know in in, in the football world. An injury comes up, you got to have somebody ready to step in and 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 do what they got to do, right, and be ready for it. And so it looks like we have somebody on deck to help out with that. Paul Williams is going to talk to us. Uh, he's got a lot of football history, like you just mentioned, both with Rams and, and high school and everything. But right now, our guest of honor, uh, all the way from Okinawa, Japan, Coach Fred Bales. Coach, welcome to the show. Glad to have you on. Uh, let me get you on the screen here, my friend. There you go. How are you, Coach? Hey, how you guys doing? Well, good morning. We're doing fantastic here uh, yesterday for you, but uh, awesome to have you on in the morning. And, and Paul Williams, our other guest here, awesome to have you guys. Welcome, guys. Glad to have you guys here. Man, I'm so happy to be here. Thank you so much, Willie. Ricky, always Thank a pleasure. You, you guys you. are doing an amazing job. You're killing it. Right on, Pablo. Right on. Appreciate that. Yep. And and it's fun. That's and the best part. Coach We're having Bales. a lot of fun doing it. Yep. And Coach Bales is on there. Yeah, because these stories, guys, this is all from the heart. You know, this is why uh, this works so well. Because every everybody that talks here is a real person talking about real history, real stories, right from the heart. I mean, it doesn't get better than that. It doesn't. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. So, Coach, how you doing? All the way from Japan. How are things going for you? Just fine. Been waiting to hop on with you guys and listening to the lots of fun stuff that you've been going through. It's good to see you again this morning, Will. <laughs> yes, yes, indeed. We had a, we had, we were doing show prep last night. It was going to be for just a few minutes, and 
turn into quite a long conversation. And I, it, had it not been for my wife coming home from the airport after being away uh, that I, I had to jump off. But otherwise, heck, I would have stayed on for another hour or two. It was, it was yeah. absolutely fantastic. Who's that rascal you got on the other screen there? <laughs> Good to see you, man. Got a, go, a couple of rascals out here. You know, we, we all, you know, Zonian somehow always congregate somewhere. No matter where it is, you'll find a Zonian. Of course, and I, I got to say, I'm a little disappointed. I was I was really looking forward to the to the chat with uh, with Jim and with uh, Coach Lou, and uh, yeah, and and Ernie Senior. So that's yeah, still point... might come on. You know, some yeah, yeah. yeah hopefully the night is young. Is always difficult. Yeah, I hope so. Well, it's the morning here, and we got stuff to do. So, so <laughs> right on, right on. Yeah, yeah, you probably know we 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 Melanie and I retired and we live in the, the villages Florida now, but we're spending the winter months here, and uh, we've been here for three <clears throat> a little over three months, and we're getting ready to go back to Florida uh, just in a couple of days. But we're here at our son Joshua's home, his wife Mayuka, and our <clears throat> excuse me, our, our newest grandchild, uh, little Emma, uh, little Emma uh, Trim Bales. She she was four months old just a couple of days ago. So I'm in the front. She's precious. Great. Congratulations, Amazing. Coach. Yeah, thanks, man. So, Coach, when did when did you first get to Panama and get involved with football? Okay, just real quick. I was uh, yeah. You know, I graduated from Balboa High School in '71, and I didn't play any football oh. there. I played basketball <coughs> and uh, ran track at Canal Zone College, and I was a golf athlete. So I spent I spent. Uh, I mean, even if I was playing on an athletic team at the time, I usually went to Amador and hit a couple of hundred balls before dinner, before dark every night, and uh, was playing with the Panama Amateur Golf Association's uh, representative team in, in, t in stateside tournaments in the summer that we had a big qualifying tournament at the old Club de Golf at Panama for. So that took up a big part of my life and, uh, and time. Uh, but when I got back in 1976, I, got, I went to the University of Tennessee after two years at uh, Canal Zone College, then I went to graduate school in England, and I came back to Panama in 76 in the summer. I had a six-month contract to uh, be the youth director at Babel Union Church, <clears throat> and I, uh, I had a teaching certificate sort of by accident, and so uh, Bob Dahlstrom, uh, Coach Rick Dahlstrom's father, hired me to substitute teach and be involved in the schools for the six months I was going to be there, and uh, that six months turned into... Uh, I fell in love with teaching and coaching. Uh, I had a long-term substitute gig. Uh, unfortunately, because there was a death in the coaching fraternity, Coach Bill Gibson, I'm sure a lot of folks Coach will Gibson, I remember, remember that. that. Yep. I recall that, that day very well. Yep. <coughs> yeah, yeah. Away. He won a championship that the year right. before. And uh, Clyde Wilman, who was the principal of the high school at the time, asked me if I would suspend my – I was going to go on to another graduate school in January – he asked me to spend the rest of the year there from November all the way out till June to take Coach Bill's PE classes. And uh, then he asked me in April if I would do a second year. And uh, by that time, I had fallen in love with it. So, And I was there until 99. And I joined the Red Machine coaching staff first. My first uh, full-time teaching gig started in August of 78, uh, the 78-79 school year. And... and uh, Coach Jim Sweeney hired me to, well, it came with an assistant football. To try to stop Paul, Paul's offense. <laughs> yeah. Well, that was my senior of... year, Coach Bales. I know, I know. So I was just a young guy. I was the back up coach, you know, on the sideline. Uh, you guys back up. Defense, over right, Coach? You were mostly defense. I did because I. it was funny. The first coaching meeting we had with the Red Machine, and I, these are the reasons I wish Coach Jim was here and, and God rest his soul, Coach Kenny Anderson, Ken was on the mm -hmm. coaching staff, and he was on the defensive side. And we had we had five or six coaches, right? So uh, Coach Sweeney convened the first coaching meeting uh, before fall camp, and it went on for a couple hours, and everybody had their assignments except me. And I was sitting at the end of the table, and Coach Sweeney sort of closed up his notes and said, okay, men, we'll see you at the school tomorrow morning. You know, and uh, Ken Anderson looked at Coach Sweeney and said, "I'll take Bales on the defensive side," <laughs> and that was that was how I got started. And Ken mentored me; he was a fantastic football coach, baseball coach, oh, yeah. just man. So he mentored me in many ways as a young teacher and a young coach. 
And uh, that started a relationship that didn't that ended in the villages in March of 2020 when Kent passed away, and Melanie and I and the boys were there for his home going and his funeral mass. And so that was a the first of many uh, profound lifetime relationships in the coaching and teaching fraternity that I had as a young man. Uh, got well, well, and you've certainly had a lifetime of of coaching. I mean that that, that story that's that's continued till. Just recently, and and how you, you've you've impacted a lot of a lot of uh, youth in Panama, and then you've turned around and done the same thing now over in Japan, and so it's yeah, a, yeah. it's a really really great story, and and you know there's there's so many twists and turns to it. Like I said last night, we spent a lot of time talking about it and how you how you got that start, and then from there, you know where where we were hoping to have the, the four coaches tonight because then we switched to a system where you had four teams on the Pacific side and you had a draft. It was no longer the Canal Zone College, which was basically the all-star team because everybody who graduated high school at BHS or even CHS was now playing for, for the college team, so they were the dominant team. Yeah, and, I was uh, on one of those teams. That yeah, really yeah, but, it was too unfair. Right. And so real quick in the audience, let's throw a real quick trivia for you. What was the last team? Because I learned this last night. What was the last team to beat the Canal Zone College while they were still a college team, not a drafted team with, with high school players? So if you know it, throw it in the chat who you think it was. I mean, take a while. I guess it's going to be one out of four, basically. I think so. Williams it was the last one that beat him. Oh, no, Jimmy Mayado beat him. Well, let's not give it away, though. Let's see what we can come in the audience, but you guys can speculate. I, I couldn't beat him. I didn't beat him. I didn't beat him. Paul beat him, Jimmy beat him, and then my year, I didn't beat him. So I would say 80. 80 was the last time. Okay. Let's see. I'm having trouble. Did you see that on the chat there from uh, Dennis? Okay. Elaborate for me if you don't mind, Dennis. Let us know what you're talking about. But yeah, anyway, keep trying to guess, guys. Anyone else have a guess? We've taken 1980, and you're saying the Bulldog 1980 team? Is that what you're saying, Ricky? Yeah, okay. Paul I'm not, Jimmy, obviously, I can't guess because I know, but. 70, Jimmy Otto in 80. Okay, we're going to see if, if if you know your canals on this. I'm going to have to th 78, What's 79 that? at it. I'm just saying. Well, while you're looking at that, I'm going to throw in, uh, you know, I used to watch Fred play basketball over at the uh, Canal Zone College gym and in the summer leagues at uh, Bobo High School back in the day in the summer. Ricky, you and I have had that little uh, SO. Remember SO? Yeah, yeah. SO, SO. We want SO. -E -S. <laughs> SO. <laughs> Excellent. Coach, you played for that team? You remember SO, Coach, back in the day? Yeah. I played you a do? lot of basketball. I was a basketball and a baseball athlete and a golf athlete primarily. And uh, I played for Coach Fink two years at Canal Zone College basketball, which were I learned so much from that man. He ran our ass and didn't give us a basketball till the second week. We had to scrimmage with a medicine ball, uh, you know, because you had the three men weave up and down and put the medicine ball in the white square so it'd go in the basket. And and uh, that was that was Coach Fink. And then he would get on his scooter with Johnson, his uh, assistant coach, the locker room attendant, West Indian fella and uh, drive off into the sunset. Coach Finkelstein had us in that gym at 6 a.m. every morning uh, for many months of the school year. Morris uh, Finkelstein. Coach Finkelstein. Had for you. The hey, list. Good, his sons were good, too. I think Paul yeah. played with them. Yeah, yep, they, yep, yep. Joe player. Finkelstein played with me in the Rams, actually. Yeah, yeah, they were great athletes, great family. And uh, anyway, but uh, and then the summer leagues over at Corundu with the double gym. That was a good brand of basketball. Oh, that was and, a great, uh, great, great courts, too, with the air conditioning. Yeah. Remember that, Paul? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. But the floor was terrible. It was not – it wasn't wood. It was uh, that – whatever they had. Vinyl the or something. Yeah. But it was it was a great venue. And then, uh, of course, I played for a bunch of years in the over-30 league with some amazing players, Ramon Reyes, El Grillo, mm -hmm. Eric Ernest. El Grillo, yes. Eric Ernest and, the, and a bunch, just a bunch of really, really great players. Flacco. Flacco, who became a Flacco, uh, Flacco Thompson. Flacco yeah. Thompson, yeah. Oh, you know who was Paul? Uh, uh, Beto, uh, what was Beto's last name? Jaime Beto Martin. Oh, oh, uh, Martin. Uh, yeah, so Martin, the older yeah. Martin. 
Coach Bill, you remember him? I just recently connected with Jaime on, on Facebook. Many, many years ago. It's Jaime's older name. brother. Yeah. Yeah. Anyway, Will mentioned the football, the draft system thing, and I and I relayed to him yesterday just in, in terms of the history. We, we were at a point, uh, and that was five years into my football coaching career. And um, by the way, uh, the hello, Devin. <laughs> the uh, I'm not a thousand percent sure, but I know we either in '81 or maybe '82, Johnny Irvin was our kicker, and we beat the the the, the Canal Zone College Green Devils strong with college freshmen and sophomores, ten to seven, one night in Balboa Stadium, with a late field goal that rattled off the roof over there at the bowling alley, and. Uh, uh, we were either the last or next to last team to. Uh, That's part the last team, yeah. And the, the the strength of the college team when, when the tuition started going sky high in the states, a lot more student athletes were staying for two years, and then transferring to a four year university. And uh, so the college team, which in the late '60s and early '70s, the Canal Zone College Green Devil teams didn't have all that many players. But all of a sudden, ten years later, they had forty dudes on their team, and they were they were like Rick, like Will said, the best players from Cristobal and Balboa Red and Balboa White, mm -hmm. and uh, they not only were they the best players, but they knew exactly what was going on in those three teams because they they'd played on them, and they had the book on everybody, and so they were yeah, that, I didn't even think about that part too. <laughs> they came with the playbook. <laughs> And so yeah, it wasn't we, fair, Coach. It wasn't fair. I I, uh, I have to admit that not when I played, it was. It, it, you know what? It made us better players, and it, it really. It sure really, did. I think it set up. There's John Williford. I think it set up, uh, and and he's had, of course, a great coaching career in Alabama. Um, the the uh, the draft system was was uh, by that time I was. I had five years of experience that I'd been around some people that knew what was going on, like Ernie Holland Sr., like Jim Swinney, like Ken Anderson, Russ Stromberg. And um, we got a, when, when the transition uh, happened in 79, we got, uh, you know, the Canal Zone schools went away and, and uh, Dodd's Panama region stood up, right, in 1979. And we got a superintendent of schools from Okinawa. He had, he had been here in the Okinawa district which is kind of a nice full circle uh, right. little tidbit. And his name was Donald Grant. And there was a draft system here in the Okinawa district because like the Canal Zone here in Okinawa, the footprint is much the same. Two high schools, uh, there's three middle schools here and then a ton, like a dozen elementary schools. And uh, we had, there's a, there was a draft system here that's long been gone and I was part of the the procedure to, to get that changed uh, in the early 2000s. But um, Donald Grant said, hey, you've got all these guys that want to play football. you got the college team nobody can beat. you got the Cristobal team that, not, that can't compete with the other three teams because it's shrinking. Why don't you just throw everybody into a pot and do a draft system and add a team so more people can play and spread out the college guys onto the four teams? It was his idea. And... Uh, of course, it was he had the original draft idea, and then I think Ernie Holland Sr. and and Jim and the, the people that were the head coaches at the time. I know Russ Stromberg was very much involved in those decisions. Came up with the model that became our draft system, and uh, and there was an expansion team, the Cougars, that was going to practice uh, at the junior high, and uh, and and I was recommended to take that head coaching job, so. That's how I got started uh, as a head coach in 1983. I coached my last high school football game on November 1st, 2019 with my beloved Kubasaki Dragons. It was in Tokyo, Japan at American School in Japan in Mustang Valley. They've got a beautiful on-campus stadium there. It's a fantastic international school that's been, it was founded in 1902 and uh, its graduation, its alumni include uh, astronauts and ambassadors and you know, Amazing. State Department, he's just incredible list of Academy Award winners. Um, it's it's got to be the water. Thing. Yeah, well, it's the money. <laughs> <laughs> that school was founded for <laughs> global CEOs and, uh, you know, their families and all that. And then those hey, people. Hey, Fred, Fred those let people. me ask you a quick question. I got a quick question about this. So yeah. when you went to a draft, 
How did you uh, meld in the guys from Cristobal? Like, how did that work out? Like, logistics-wise. Yeah. I'd, I'd be interested to hear about that. I'm sure the uh, listeners want to hear a little bit about that. Okay, real quick. Cristobal uh, had a great bunch of guys over there and some really fine teachers and coaches, but they, they were um, – you know, it, it seemed like they had a different coach every year uh, in football. Or, or one guy would take the head job one year, one guy would take it. After, you know, historically, Cristobal High School won many championships in the 60s. And I don't know how many, but they had some great teams. Uh, um, coach Lado, um I, for, I forget how to pronounce his last name, a guy from Louisiana. Maybe he's from Missouri. Anyway, he's the guy that brought the first jamboree to Canal Zone football. Uh, which had a 50-year history, I think, the Jamboree on the on the Atlantic side. Um, but the, uh, the 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 idea was to um, spread these college guys out, and so, but we didn't initially have the college Tigers, the, the Tigers that were going to Canal Zone College, or or by that time it was Panama Canal College (PCC), and they would come over and live in the dorm. Right. And uh, they would show up on our four teams. You know, we would draft them. Uh, but, right. uh, I had a couple of Garen. I had the Garinger, uh Robert, I think. I had some I had some good guys, some good Tigers. And then at one point and, and they went several years without winning a game and they were talking about dropping football, which was not going to be good for anyone. For Cristobal right. High School or or the Pacific side or the league. Right. So Dr. Wolf, who was the, the our super our our director of Godia Panama, called us up, the, the four head coaches over there and said, "Look, we have a problem with Cristobal. What can we do?" And it was like unanimous verbatim out of our mouths at the same time: hire a coach, hire someone with football, a deep football background. So he did. He uh, a couple of days later, he had a bunch of applications showing extensive. Um, football experience in big football states, California, Virginia, Florida. And he ended up hiring a guy named Richard Elliott, who had been coaching in several of those big football states. Richard Elliott came. He got there about a week late. He got there like a week before the Jamboree. And that year, and I don't recall exactly what year it was, but Cristobal Tigers immediately became competitive. They were fundamentally sound. They were blocking. They were tackling. They were discipline they were organized had the right guys in the right places and he ran a very uh a very clean tight uh offense uh just a few plays with uh, really you know excellent execution some good play action passing and 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 he immediately became somebody that was hard to get the w against but he was also an advocate for his guys as he should be right it should have been. And so he started, this is all to your question, coach. He started advocating for the Tiger players that were at Canals on College to play for him on the Tigers. Sure. It makes sense. Makes sense. I like it. He made a couple of them commuted to their classes at the college from their home in Cristobal. Others lived in the little dorm that was over in La Boca, right? Yeah. But they yeah. could have classes in the morning and hop the train or, or take their, their, their car and be at practice by 2.30 or 3.00 certainly in Coca Solo. So they started doing that. He got permission. We changed the rule. He got to do that. And then they they won a championship. They won a championship, and I forget exactly what year, but it was the last Cristobal Tigers football championship. Somebody can probably Yeah, yeah. Sweeney Sweeney sent us a big a big thing on it. Hear me look it up, coach. Yeah, he, he sent up a, a, a quite quite the write up. Um let me see if we... Anyway, that's the answer to your question, Coach. So, yeah, they commuted. Well, that's kind of cool. Right. So, 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 Fred, the majority, the, right. of the, players, that? the majority of the Cristobal players then weren't in the draft, right? Is that what you were saying? They just – Initially, they were. The ones that came to, to the commute. college, came to the Pacific side, they were in the draft. And then when Coach Elliott got to the Tigers, he said, this is baloney. Those guys need to be playing for us because all those four Pacific teams have college players and we don't have any. So it was back to 
Um, you know, we, we, we had like eight, ten guys, seven, six, seven, eight Juco guys on the field on both sides of the ball on any given snap. You know, hey guys, I have a we have a surprise. Uh, somebody's joining us here, Coach Holland. How are you? Oh, oh, right on, uh, Coach Holland. There's my yes. man. Yes. How you doing? You guys Good. look old, man. Hey, <laughs> hey, man. He's got a little coach. Is great to see you. Welled up. So great. And, and by the way, um, real quick, uh, happy belated birthday. My understanding it was your birthday yesterday. So happy birthday, Coach. Right on, Coach. Happy birthday, Coach. Eighty-three. Awesome. Awesome. 83. Wow. Great right on. Wow. It's three. so good to see you, Coach. It's, it's been years oh, since man. I've seen you. It is really, really good to see. You. I'm glad you made it on here, and uh, we're just uh, we're just sharing memories about about high school. We're uh, talking about football, something that that you guys had such a huge impact on our lives, and and made made for me high school awesome. Made made it really the experience it's supposed to be, and and so uh, I'm glad that you guys are here to tell us all about it. So, and there's Coach Bales from the other side of the world. Good morning, Coach Bales. Yes, look, I want before we go any further, and now that Coach Holland's on, I want to say a few words to him and for him. Um, I think Will, Will and I talked for a couple hours yesterday in sort of preparation for this, and I was sharing with Will some of the stories he was asking me, you know, about my development as a coach. And Coach Holland, you know, I told him, and I've told you this many times, I guess the last time you and I talked was 2010 when we traveled to Panama that summer. I went over to Albrook. We got down in the in the underneath this house and we got on the chalkboard and we talked football for a couple hours. Uh, remember that day, Coach? Uh, there in Albrook, that was a lot of fun. But what, what I was going to say is that Coach Holland, um, he and Kenny Anderson basically taught me how to coach high school football. Kenny is a is a coaching colleague on my staff that you know on the Red Machine and then ultimately on the Cougars. He was my first defensive coordinator. And Coach Holland taught me first, uh, you know, how to compete against championship caliber players and championship caliber coaching. And we had some tremendous battles, but he was always classy. Um, the, in 84, we won the championship, and, and he was a, by that time assistant principal at the high school, I think. And he sent, he sent um, a letter to me, a formal letter. Uh, telling me how how impressed he was with our team, their character, their their execution, just the way that their demeanor, the whole deal, and congratulated me on our on our championship, and uh, said that I reminded him of him, him as a young coach, and uh, so he was extremely important uh, in my development as a as a football coach and as a mentor of football student athletes, and. Um, and I, I, I want to say this, too, before I forget it. He was always gracious along the line. And we had some, I mean, don't get me wrong. We had some amazing battles uh, on the field on Friday nights. And uh, But the last year of Balboa High School football, the 98 season, uh, I went to Coach Holland, who was the dean of Panama Canal College at the time. He had been uh, away from coaching, on the field coaching for a long time. He still sat up in the bleachers and called some plays for the Bulldogs out of his briefcase for many years. Um, <laughs> but he, uh, I, I said I, I said to Rick Dahlstrom and Lou Husted, who were the two paid assistant coaches, I said, look, this is the last year of Babel High School football. It's full circle. We're wearing the red and white. It's the Babel High School Bulldogs. And there's somebody in this community we have to get on this coaching staff if we can. I didn't think for a million years he would say yes. But I went over to the college and walked up to his office and I asked him to be the offensive line coach. And there was no better offensive line coach in the history of Panama football. I asked him if he would be our offensive line coach. And he said yes. And he had two Teflon knees by that time or titanium knees or whatever. I don't know. It had double knee replacement. But uh, he came out and with his new knees, he wrestled those offensive linemen, jerked them around, got them in their stances, got their steps down, got their flat backs blocking for the run, got their pass pros together, and was just a tremendous addition to the last coaching staff of the last season of Babel High School football. Thank you, Coach Holland. <laughs> yeah, well, yeah, we all have similar stories. We all have similar stories. Coach, before I let Paul get involved, because he has a lot to talk 
I I want to let you know, Coach, one of the greatest gratitudes I have for you, sir, uh, one of the big, greatest things that ever happened to me was you selected me to be a quarterback for you my senior year in high school. And for that, I've had such great gratitude. And really, it made me, in many ways, who I am, my leadership, you know, my, my, you know, mostly anything leadership is what you taught me. And, you know, I've been very grateful. I never had a chance to tell you this. But now that I have you on live, thank you from the bottom of my heart, Coach. Yeah, I remember. I remember how many time, how many hair you lost from your legs. <laughs> <laughs> that was one of my techniques. You can't do that now. Okay. Yes. If I I, 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 I showed you the take technique three times. If you didn't get into three times, then I, I gather all the team together and I say I want hair from his legs, and I want to see everybody bring me some hair from his legs. This will teach him to do it correctly. That is correct. <laughs> that is correct. That's, correct. that's the only way. I, that's the how I learned. That is correct. You, you can't do that anymore. <laughs> Can't do that anymore. But, you know, you had two quarterbacks before me that won championships. One of those guys is right here with you, Paul Williams. Yeah, Paul hey, Williams coach. was a little strange, but yeah, uh, right there, but right he was there. good. Paul's there. He there was smart. Go. He Paul's was smart. The, Paul's in the camera. Very smart. Paul's there. Where's the camera? Yeah. Paul, Paul's in the middle. Oh, in the middle, yeah. That's Paul. Yeah, Paul, I remember you. Yeah, yeah. And uh, he wanted to run the ball all the time. But uh, I don't know. It was a running back at the Rams, you know, and they made me a damn quarterback. You yeah. Know? yeah. I was a lineman and he made me a quarterback. The Rams were different. Uh, they were good, but uh, they didn't know good technique. <laughs> That's right, Coach. So well, you talk about they, getting some hair. They, I got to throw a little history, Ricky they, and they, Willie. They didn't, they didn't know. Coach, they, didn't, they didn't have discipline. Okay. That's right. Yeah. Well, we we thought we did, but then we got to your team, and it, yeah, it was a much different, uh, much different level. I think the you cage remember, taught us remember, discipline. Remember the cage and the spacer, and yeah. uh, uh, I was pretty tough on you guys, but but that's that what that's what it takes. You got to build character, and I try to build right. character with you. And I told you, you got to show up for practice. You don't show up for practice. You got 10 cages after practice if you miss. Yep. And if you come late, okay, then you got 10 cages after practice. So people didn't miss. Or Nobody I, missed. And you, you build character that way. Uh, and I, I feel, uh, you know, I have many, many, many people that I've coached. Uh, even today, they, they, the varsity Kiwani uh, program started, and I got coaches in the mid halftime right now. I'm watching, and uh, they're calling me, Coach. What do I do next? And uh, yeah, but I'm still thinking about it. But I'm I'm slowing down, slowing down. You're still a legend down there, Coach, because I have been to Panama recently and seen the football programs. And, every, you know, and I always mention, I play for Coach Hall, and they all say you are the grandfather or the godfather, actually, of football in Panama. Yeah, there's there's thousands of kids that are playing now, especially flags, especially the girls. and uh, Rank six? The girls. Well, right. play, and, and then they well play. and it's great that – that your legacies you carried it on with with your sons helping out and so that you know the 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 holland family is is a football family not just you and and so um yeah, yeah, yeah absolutely and, and for what it's worth you know i would always ask people man you shave your legs off like no you know just they never grew back so uh, i learned my le painful lessons playing for the bulldogs but uh no you know last night is funny from talking to coach bales um and i mentioned that to him you know Certainly a lot of great, you know, memories with the Rams. And that was a big part of our lives, uh, especially anybody that lived in Balboa. Um, but I remember when I when I joined the Bulldogs, it it really was a big step up. You know, I mean, it was a much more sophisticated offense. The, everything about it was, you know, you kind of look at it like, wow, I'm, this is big time. <laughs> you know, it's it's a whole different animal there. And 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 to your credit, you drilled us to execute, execute, execute. I mean, everything to your point of having to get in that stance and do it right. No, back your leg up. 
about two or three inches there. That's the right technique. Those kind of things was just, it, it was, you know, I've used it when I've coached here and, and, you know, anytime I've ever coached, I go back into my memory banks of what I, you know, what, you know, coach Holland taught me, you know, what coach Cotton and coach Gayer taught me and everyone. And, and it really is to me, that's, those are the most impactful years for me of, of the biggest memories I have in my life. And, and football was a big part of it. We all love football. We, Hey, we talk about football all year long. It's not even football season, and we've done four football programs now. You know, so you know, so I'm very grateful for 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 you. First of all, selecting me, like Ricky said, selecting me onto onto your team, uh, and 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 giving me the chance to 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 play and have fun. And one quick question: Was I the only player on your team to hit the goalpost and catch a pass? Because I don't know if anybody else ever did. No, there were several others too. <laughs> okay. Because every time I talk to him, oh, wait, you're the one who hit the goal post. Yeah, that was me. Sorry, that was me. You know. Yeah, and did you catch the ball? No, I dropped the ball too. Sorry. <laughs> but uh, yeah. Fred, Bale, Fred Bales came a long way, I tell you. Uh, yeah. He, yeah. He, uh, oh. uh, I thought you meant geographically. Coach. He was. He would always. <laughs> he would always be bugging me and stuff like that. And sometimes he, when he had his own team, he'd look around the corner to see what I was doing. But that was okay. I knew he was there, and yeah. he, he, learned, <laughs> he learned a lot. And then later on, when he moved to another person place, uh, I would say, "Fred, you got to go and see what they're doing in the states." Because I said every summer I go and talk to my friends in Texas, and they tell me the latest. You got to do the same thing. He went to a minor place like Tennessee, but but that was okay. They're not as good as Texas, but he he did he learned. <laughs> We're gonna find out this next season. Yeah. That's right, good old Rocky Top. I'm a Vols fan by marriage, so when I said I do, that included the whole package, the the, the team know, and everything. So I, I I'm showing you guys this mug. It says Pano on it. Our son. Yeah, Josh, we see it. We're standing in his front yard here. He he works for a defense contractor on Kadena Air Base here. Oh, okay. Joshua, both Yo, of our boys, yeah. Caleb and Joshua both played football at Kubasaki High School. Caleb graduated in 2007 and um, Joshua in 2010. Caleb was a, a – and both of you know, we – I always like to say, you know, we were – our boys were really blessed because uh, they at least had a chance to be good-looking and smart because they didn't have any of my DNA. You know, they're both kind of men. <laughs> yeah, uh, well, they were adopted, which means that they were good-looking. Yes, that's what I said. <laughs> they had a chance in life, you know. No, none of my DNA. Paul anyway. Williams, tell me a little bit about yourself. You haven't come to Panama anymore. I'm coming, Coach, in June. Oh, good. Yep, good. yep. I'm on the down slope. Got a couple more years, two, three years of work. Um, oh, I've been fishing. Good. You know, I, you know, some of the things that you guys talk about learning how from you, Coach. How are your uh, kids doing? Uh, they're doing great, Coach. Uh, all four of them are doing great. I got three out of college, highly successful. I got my young one who's about 220. Uh, he's like wow. 6'1", 220. He, he's a junior at uh, in, in Athens, Georgia. Yeah. Um, loves to fish. Right. Carrying on oh. the tradition of fishing. Bring him over. Yep, I'm going to bring him. I'm bringing him. We uh, I make my own uh, lures. My I own know jigs. your your jigs. Your jigs are they're, I, I, they're world I, famous. I don't I don't sell them. I give them away to the fishermen out there, and they tell me which ones work the most. And I'm, I I have hundreds of them. So when well, you come I'm coming down, to see you, when you come down, I'll be coming to see you this June. I'll be stopping by with my tackle box, an empty tackle box, just yeah. so uh, I can fill it up, but. Uh, a couple of stories with Coach Holland, you know. Um, I, I started hunting and fishing with Coach probably in the ninth grade, maybe the eighth grade. Right, right. the swamps uh, of Tennessee. The swamps of Tennessee. The swamps of Tennessee. We'd go duck hunting. We'd go bird hunting. I went fishing all the time. When I got to high school, and uh, little Ernie would call. He was probably like six or seven years old, and you know, I'd be out late with the boys, you know, Ricky, I'd be out late with the boys on a Friday night. And I was in 10th grade. I don't know if being out late. Ernie would call the house at four in the morning and, and my mom would wake up and say, uh, hey, Paul, uh, uh, Coach Holland's son's on the phone. He said, you 
you got to wake up. He's going to pick you up. And I'm like, tell him I'm not going today. He called right back and said, be on the curb. <laughs> and so <laughs> I'd be out front of the house at about 4.30. Coach comes swinging by and picked me up. And we, uh, Coach and I would take the two young boys out fishing out in you know, the bay, right? But, you know, I, I, I remember the story, Coach, was years later that you told me you brought me along in case something happened. I could at least drive the boat back, take care of the boys. You know, like if something happened to him, uh, I was the safety net. So, uh, you know, those are great days, great memories, uh, fishing with you, hunting with you, yeah. obviously playing football so for you. Yeah, oh, right. Coach, that's so, our, that must have been around the time when you first got to Panama because you did live above me in, in El Prado when you guys first moved there. Oh, so right. when did you start coaching? Like right when you moved to Panama, you came in right to coach football? So, I was coaching in uh, Galena Park right outside of, of Houston. And we had we, that year before, we had uh, gone to the state finals. And I was part of the coaching staff, and uh, uh, and I came to Panama because I married a beautiful young lady from Panama, and we came down uh, just to visit. And uh, in the, the the old days, there was uh, a museum is uh, was uh, right right there, and the education division was also there. So I went in there and said, "You guys play football here." And he said, yeah, yeah. And appar apparently uh, the principal was there. I mean, not the principal, the superintendent. Superintendent. And yeah. he, had, he, he was principal at Balboa, but he could never beat Cristobal. Yeah. Okay. Oh, no. <laughs> right. Right. Coach Perez was talking Cristobal. about that, those championship years. <laughs> and so I went in and started talking and said, oh, you're coaching. And you went to the, <clears throat> the state final? He said, yeah. I said, yeah, I was one of part part of the, uh, part of the coaching staff. And he said, uh, let me bring Anderson in there. The other, uh, he was uh, the athletic director. So they, we started talking. He said, well, just hold on a minute. Let me go in and, and, and talk to Anderson. So he said, do you want a job here? And, and I said, well, I have a job and I have a good job. And he said, how much do you make over there? And I said, well, I make so much. He said, just hold on a minute. They went back into the office. I'm not supposed to be telling the story. I don't know what <laughs> well, it is. Well, your indications uh, up. You're good. Don't worry, go 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 alive or not. But anyway, uh, they came out and said, you know, we can almost double your wage if wow. you stay here. And I, and I knew the reason because somebody had told me they had never been able to beat Cristobal. All right. So that story came. I didn't tell it to anybody. I'm telling it to you guys. Yeah, yeah. It's not going to work. You hear it first. Happy hour in the BYC story. is where you get the exclusives, guys. The zoning That's exclusive story. right here on Friday night. Real story. So, uh, anyway, uh, uh, Gibson was, 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 had just been appointed for the job. And so, so he said, "Well, I'm put you at Balboa, but you could be teaching somewhere else at, at, at Corundu." So uh, then, uh, uh, I, I I told my wife, "What do you want to do?" Is well, let's stay here. Heck yeah, <laughs> it's a win-win. She's back home, and you doubled your salary, and in the canal zone. So I, I right. came at that time, and, and then. We never lost to Cristobal after that. Uh, now, Bale, right on. Bale, Ernie was coaching at Cristobal one day, one time, and I said, Dad, how do I defense Fred Bales? And I said, yeah. oh, geez, you first got to get – get." he had a tremendous receiver, and he had a tremendous quarterback. I said, you got to pay bump and run on that receiver. Take that receiver away from him, okay? And then – and then uh, – uh, and then your middle linebacker, he had a real middle linebacker. Your middle linebacker takes care of the fullback. Forget about everything else, and, and the middle linebacker takes care of the fullback. So we stopped the receiver. We stopped the fullback. And we won the game, and Fred had a fit. <laughs> <laughs> Surely not. 
<laughs> yeah, but but th those are the old days, and uh, that story I just told you is not true. I, 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 well, and and you're telling it to a bunch of Zonians and Panamanians who know how to keep secrets anyway, so don't worry. <laughs> yeah. oh, look. You know? It's not true. I just made it up. Uh, <laughs> Chris, uh, Chris okay. Tomo, I, the coach was talking about, about uh, as a young head coach, I was learning stuff, and he, he did counsel me to start going to the States in the summer, and, and I was doing that already. Uh, when we would go, when we would go and leave, I would go to the in Knoxville, Tennessee, and also over in Conway, Arkansas, I went to the local high schools. In fact, I got in a couple of team pictures that were shot during their fall camps. <laughs> it's like uh, I, remember, yeah, I made some really lifelong friends in those summers. And the place, and I, I did spend a little time at Tennessee, but we spent most of our time in Arkansas during the summer in Conway, Arkansas. at the, And two miles from my mother-in-law's house was the University of Central Arkansas, the UCA Bears. When I started going there, in, uh, well, Melanie and I got married in 1980. She was in college there. She graduated in 1980. So I would go up uh, in the summers and on break, I was already teaching and coaching. And I went over to the football office. And at that time, they were in the Arkansas Intercollegiate Conference in NAIA ball. And small little stadium, small little coaching complex, small little football operations, uh, et cetera. But they had some really great teams. Uh, I, I put a couple of our guys up there later on. A couple of our Cougars uh, got up there. Um, they didn't stay because, uh, and I'm not going to give you their names, but they had the talent to play there. And uh, anyway, I made some lifelong uh, friends on that coaching staff. Well, by the time Joshua and Caleb graduated from Kubasaki, they both went to Central Arkansas. And Joshua ended up volunteering. Joshua was a really good football running back. Chorirano sort of a bull he had a really like a four six forty guy and he was a, he was a very fine high school running back high school wrestler and um he had some chances to go to some d3 schools but he chose to go to central arkansas and by that time they were division two ncaa and he ended up in the football program as first on the operations side manager then he moved up in operations then he became a student coach and uh by that time they were division one double a or the old division one double a fcs football championship subdivision so he got uh, five years of coaching experience there in a d1 program and i lived in their film room every summer and i was on the field when they started their fall camp i was in their training facility for strength and conditioning so i took your advice coach holland and i i i spent a, a good amount of time every summer staying current not just in schemes but in techniques uh, you know, it was amazing how the, the offensive line blocking techniques for both run and pass evolved over the 43 years I coached high school football, 32 years as a head coach. And I continued that relationship all the way up. Joshua graduated in 2015 from Central Arkansas. And uh, then he came back to Okinawa and he was on my coaching staff at Kubasaki for the last uh, five seasons of my coaching career. Um, <laughs> there he is on there's, the screen. There's his picture, number 21. That that mm. game was at a high school in Tokyo, Japan, number 21 in the green and white. Great, great. So, so, so to put that picture in context, this is a running back from Chorera running yes. in Okinawa, Japan. Right? right. So, wow. It was in Tokyo. We flew the game. In we Tokyo, were, Japan. There you go. He was wow. a thousand miles from his practice field that night, that Friday night in Yokota. Tokyo, yeah, Yokota Air Base. Amazing. Super, super. Air, but Tokyo, Japan. We yeah. would fly on Friday, play on Saturday, fly home on Sunday. Right. That's right. what we did for years. So. Yeah. That's and awesome. Teams would play us in Okinawa. Great, great. Because in oh, Okinawa, yeah. we only have Kadena High School. There's an Air Force High School, basically an Air Force High School and a Marine High School on Okinawa. And uh, so then we played we played games in Tokyo every year, also in Seoul, Korea, Osan, Korea, Daegu, Korea, Guam. And uh, we played twice in the Singapore uh, against the Singapore American Falcons. Did you guys know this? That I've coached five NFL players from Panama. Yes. Wow. I knew. Five NFL players from left went from here and played played in the states. What I what I would do is I would get them a scholarship in college first. Of several of them went to Baylor. And uh, 
Daryl uh, Gardner went to Baylor. Yeah, and, and, the and, Cougar. and the thing is that uh, uh, they come and see me now and then, but uh, uh, but Ricky over here had uh, left two left feet. I really had to work with that guy. Ricky <laughs> coach, 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 coach. Wait, let's let's go back, Coach. First, you wanted me on defense because you left feet with no hair on him. I played defense in the Jamboree and then I guess like the first game. And then the the junior that was quarterbacking, I guess you didn't like him. He wasn't scoring. didn't have to leave the trip. And then you go, Royal, get in on a quarterback. That's what happened. But you did train me all spring because you knew that. Because Jimmy Mayado, I don't remember Jimmy Mayado. Of course. Of course, yeah. He left, and he wasn't supposed to leave. And then he left, and then you were left without a quarterback. So – you, you had a finer quarterback, and you selected three of us. Mike Williams, me, and I forgot the, the junior's name, but there was a third one. And the junior had played for you the year before. Right. Mike Sims. Mike Sims is his name. Right, right. So you had, you had you know, I guess, you know, you, you picked us for whatever reason. So you You're had a choice. Yeah, You're so you brought me in. But we won four games that year. I won three of them for you. Yeah, but well, uh, yeah, actually, you won them for you for you because you're yeah, on the sixth bench if you didn't. No, no, you had me on defense. <laughs> I, 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 you had me at rover at rover first, which I love that position because I right. killed it in the jamboree. Right. But then you brought me into quarterback for about five games or four games, and I won three of them. And then right. uh, Canals on College destroyed us, and that's the game that right. you really prepare me for. But they just yeah. Yeah, they had a good game that that day. Yeah, most of those kids uh, were coached by me anyway. <laughs> right, 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 right. <laughs> the following year, I went so, to college, and we crushed everybody. So, <laughs> Coach, <laughs> Coach Holland, I, 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 just as an addendum to the to me taking your advice and going to the states in the summer and sitting down with guys that were doing it for a living and and in right. high school and in collegiately, and I did that. But let me just share this with you and with the the listeners and and the panel that's there today, I probably learned as much or more football from you, and it was in the off-season. I had my own off-season tutorial sessions in Coach Holland's office at Balboa High School. I would show up there, how you doing, Coach? And I had a, I, it was it was by design. I would show, and we're talking 85, 84, 85, 86, 87, 88, 89, 90, 91, 92, those years like that. And sit down, how you doing, man? Yeah, this is, I'm talking January, February, March, you know, whenever, dry season. And then I would float a football question to him. Two hours later, we would be there still drawing on paper. He taught me his offense. Every step, every block, every, this is why we do this, this is why we do that. Those were the best scouting sessions that I ever needed with the, to compete against the Balboa High School Bulldogs. But he, and I'm being a little facetious there, but he, I also would draw out for him and discuss with him why and how we did business in the Cougars on the offensive and defensive side, how we treated practice schedules, how we treated personnel, how we, I didn't have my players running around yanking hair out of people's legs. I was a little more uh, enlightened as a young coach than that, but we busted their tail in the cage. We, We dug trenches with our cage behind the F building over there at Karundu, and uh, I learned I learned how to coach. I learned uh, basically how to coach the whole program from Coach Holland. I learned how to coach defensive technique and football from Kenny Anderson. I learned how to coach a, a high school football, a high level high school football program from Ernie Holland, senior. And uh, he was he was happy to share his vast knowledge with me. Like I said, he agreed to come out and be our O-line coach the last that last wonderful historic year of Babel High School football. And then on my three subsequent trips to Panama in the summers, I think we went to Panama in 2003, 2007, 2010. I went to his house, looked him up. We spent another couple. Uh, his wife would give us some some uh, sancocho or something. Then we would go and get on the chalkboard for or on the, you know, the paper roller or whatever it was, look at film. Uh, I would always take some VHS tapes of my guys, what we were doing in Japan, and uh, we kept talking football. So when you have football, 
people, you know, that, that, that have that level of investment in terms of learning over an extended period of time, that's how you build programs. And like the legacy program that Coach Holland and Eric Holland have built there in Panama till this day. By the way, Coach Holland, and he may be listening, I have a friend who works, he has really good connections in the NFL, but he he has a program that um, he works with, with players from all sports in the overseas schools. He found it in his heart to, uh, he heard about the military overseas kids about 10 years ago, I guess, or seven or eight, and he came out to Okinawa and ran some camps. His name is John Bankhead. Uh, he was a, a collegiate player. He was in the Cowboys camp for a while. Uh, didn't make an NFL roster. Then he made, made a, a living uh, with his own construction company in California, Southern California, for a lot of, long time. Then he retired from that and became a trainer, uh, a wide receiver and quarterback trainer. And he's, he's next, next, next level. He's trained a lot of NFL receivers. Uh, and he, uh, I told him about Panama. So he's, and so he, he, like you, and like on a lesser scale, guys like me and the other coaches over the years have uh, pointed kids in the direction of a college program uh, on he, that's his deal. And he's never been to Panama, but I've been, I, I just had a lunch meeting with him two days ago. He's actually here in Okinawa right now. He's doing camps in Okinawa and also in the Philippines. Um, and <clears throat> I told him about Will, told him about this broadcast. I think he may be listening. If he's not, he can watch it. Uh, you archive it on the Facebook page yeah. so he can watch it. And, and but, YouTube. Yeah. So, Will, he's going to be in contact with you. Okay. And in particular, the Cross Initiative. We're sending a lot of kids uh, from here, from Panama to Mexico. Yes. Uh, yes you know. They're really – and, and they're, they bring coaches down here to see our kids. And, uh, and they have uh, – little camps and stuff like that right. because uh now remember that we have the uh uh the people the people that, that that worked on the canal which is the jamaicans and, and the west indians they're very talented very quick people and and we were even sending them uh, some some black kids and they really love them because the main thing the main thing about these these uh Jamaican kids is they have discipline. Yes. Their parents are not uh, are very disciplined people, and and they're they're not the regular kind uh, of, of, of 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 bad uh, uh, kids. And and what happens is they understand that Jamaican and the West Indian families have discipline in their home, and they come in here and we send a whole bunch, and we send about six of them this last year to Mexico nice. and, uh, and they, they play there and they always ask me and I said, well, I think he, he can play in Mexico, uh, but uh, the college level, you know, you have to be a little different. Sure. And, uh, uh, that's, that's basically what happened. Now the flag program for the girls is unreal. I mean, the, the, the seven year olds that have teams and a lot of kids, the, a lot of, players that I've coached are coaching all these little leagues. And uh, you know that the, the girls, the, the, the big girls, they played the U.S. last year. And, uh, and, I, oh. and here uh, for, the, for, the, for, the, for the final. Uh, Coach, I saw they were ranked sixth in the world. Right, right, right. And so uh, Panama has completely changed, completely changed. You know that the middle class here, they really don't have uh, too many sports, especially for the middle class people and the, the private school kids. And so so they want sports for the girls. And uh, we introduced that. And then they're out there playing, you know, like football. So anyway. By uh, the way, they're hey, playing flag. Well, Coach Bankhead is, is very interested in, in flag football. The leagues that he's got started in the Philippines are flag leagues. Yes, yeah. And um, and uh, so so he's going to be he's going to be hitting you up, Will, and he's going to get down to. I'm sure he'll get down to Panama. And I showed him yeah. the clip. I showed him Eric, Coach Holland. Eric sent me uh, in 2020 the clip of the U16 team that beat USA 
right. in Texas. Right. I, I, I watched that game. Uh, Roots. There was a Roots quarterback and co- yeah. Hi guys. Hi coaches. How you doing, Paul? Yeah. I watched yeah, it on yeah, TV yeah. here in the United States. One day, just going through the channels, and I see the uh, the United States high school all stars against the Panama all stars. Right. Your son was the coach. Uh, right. Young Roots was the quarterback who made MVP that game, and you guys crushed those guys. Yeah, you, right, you right. guys beat the American All Stars, and all those kids were going to major colleges. Yeah, it was a it was a good little team. That team, uh, uh, that team, six kids got uh, uh, got uh, sent to uh, U.S. high schools uh, nice. on special programs, and I think of those six, three got uh, Division three, Division two uh, football scholarships. Nice, uh, amazing, but, yeah, the majority great of those legacy. Kids, yeah, you were like on SPN or something like that. I mean, on uh, uh, ESPN or something like that. I remember. ESPN. The majority yeah, of them. by surprise. The majority of those kids, their goal is not um, not to get a scholarship. They're just doing it for fun. Yep, yep. The difference from the right. U.S. kids uh, in public schools. Uh, so, but the do what you love and love what you do. A couple of receivers that I had there and and linemen that 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 was their goal. So they did get to go to. Some local high schools in the states, and they got uh, they they got a that good opportunity to get up there to the states and and you know get an sure. education in the United States. So that, that was, was awesome. awesome. That was so it's, it was excellent. I tell everybody about that game. I think I told yeah, Paul. Uh, yeah, oh, did you see that game? Uh, we talked about it. Yeah, it was good. If that yeah, kid roots, well, those roots have been good forever. Man. Like I can say we we always talk about the roots because all of us competed. Paul competed against them. I competed yeah. against them. Paul Myers well, competed did. against them. Yeah, you you yeah. competed against some with Johnny. So many rules. Well, Eric, and listen, we're going to have you on to talk about your what you've done with football in Panama because that in itself is, you know, I think most people that have not stayed in Panama don't know the story and don't know how big football is in Panama now and 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 what a role you played in that. So I'm I'm looking forward to that story and and on the side, by the way, I want to talk to you about something else uh, with lacrosse that hopefully you might be able to. To help me out there, I've uh, I've been recently appointed communications director for Panama Lacrosse. Uh, they've got a really good team. It's made up mostly of of, of kids of, of, of Panamanians and Zonians right now here in the states, but they're they're highly ranked. They're they they they've taken names and won several international championships, and they're they're gunning for the 2028 Olympics, which is now a lacrosse is an official Olympic sport. So uh, so I've been tasked with with getting that going in Panama for the next generation as well and thing and, and kind of establish that. So, yeah, well, so I will be picking your brain on that for sure. We'll talk later uh, about Panama government sports and all that federation stuff. I know how that works. So yeah, we'll yeah that would be awesome. And I'll, uh, I'll let you know how to, how to improve that program. Oh, that'd be great. Absolutely. Absolutely. But guys, let's go back to the original focus of this show, which was uh, Pacific side high school football. Um, and, uh, coach Holland, I want you and, and coach Bales, we were talking last night, uh, about, uh, when you guys finally changed to the draft and hey, uh, uh, there you go, Willie, Willie, right before yeah. you go, I got to jump, but I wanted to say, you know, thank you so much for having me on and coach, I'll see you in June. Uh, awesome. hey, Pablo, thanks for being on Paul. Right, appreciate it. Great to see you. Yeah, Paul, and, and, and hopefully we'll have you on here what, next week or the week after uh, on yeah. some rant stuff there for sure. That. Yeah. What, do you awesome. have your, what do you have on your face there? It's white. <laughs> what do you have on your face? Take it off, man. Take it off. <laughs> hey, I, 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 I look forward to it. <laughs> That's Take fine. care, Pablo. All right. All right. Yeah, so, so um, coaches, tell us about that draft because – you know, my understanding that wasn't uh, wasn't the easiest thing to figure out who's going to get what players and then figure all that stuff out. So, what was that like? And I'm mean, having to to know that some of your players that you counted on that were you know on your team for maybe a year or two now are going to be playing for another team against you. What was that like? What happened is we had a new superintendent that came down from Europe. Okinawa. He was he Okinawa, came from Okinawa or some, somewhere yeah. else. And, Donald and, Grant. And they had something similar. So uh, we were running out of, uh, we, he, what he really wanted was more teams. Okay? Sure. And uh, 
uh, Cristobal was 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 drawing down, and uh, and we we the Bulldogs have been winning for a long time, and and uh, uh, the principal came to me and said, "What do you think about this?" Well, I said, "Well, shoot, I'm gonna I'm gonna lose half of my team." <laughs> Half of my good kids went to bread bales. <laughs> yes. <laughs> anyway, uh, uh, I said, "Well, I'm going to lose some kids, but it's better for the program." And and they divided them up. We divided them up by by letters, uh, and uh, it turned out to be good. Uh, we still won that, that same year, and then Fred started catching up with us, and uh, and, and Hughstead was there also. And Cristobal still was around, not, not much, but but anyway, we, we divided it up, and it turned out to be a good uh, good situation for the kids. More kids were playing, okay, right. and uh, uh, it made it made it better. And uh, now, I would you guys say that it was more competitive because of that? It was, it was okay. And, uh, Matter of fact, I I, uh, I pushed the superintendent to hire Fred as a coach. He doesn't realize that, but uh, he owes me. <laughs> I, 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 ta I was talking to Will yesterday in, the, in preparation for the show, and I, I told him that. I said, I'm not quite exactly sure who it was that, you know, that put their finger on the scale for me to be the, the head coach of the expansion team, the Cougars, but I knew it had to be you or Stromberg or – Kenny, I mean, or a combination thereof. And so I've always appreciated that. I always appreciated Coach Sweeney for giving me a shot. Um, yeah, right. I learned an awful lot. Uh, the five years that I spent on the Red Machine right. staff, I learned an awful lot. Of course, Kenny was there with us. Kenny Anderson, rest his soul, uh, yeah. was with us uh, for those five, for three of those five years, I think. But I think that, that Coach Holland and I came at the draft system from two different perspectives. I was coming from the standpoint of an assistant coach moving to build an entirely new team, you know, pick the colors. Well, we, we picked black and gold because, you know, we were obviously we were not the Corundu junior high Cougars, but we were the, that was the practice facility. And it was in my mind, the best one. We had three fields and we had a great locker room and a weight room. And, uh, it was just a wonderful place to practice football. And, uh, the bus, the, the, the athletes would bust to us in the afternoons, and I just had to walk up the stairs from the locker room and greet them and get them in a quick meeting and get them on the field. And uh, then they would bus back to Bible High School and take the activity buses home. Um, but so then it's so, but but to the, the question of did it raise the competitive level of the league, I would agree with Coach Holland and say yes for several reasons. It made it more fair. Uh, and so the games became more competitive just on an individual game basis. But it elevated the play because now every team had JUCO players. Essentially, we were coaching. We went from coaching high school football to coaching JUCO football. And that in itself is a different level. And we had some great athletes. I mean, some unbelievable football players that coach, uh, you know, uh, so um, and, and, and tremendous people, you know, people that you could coach and, and you could build programs around and, and, um, and, and football had a great following in this zone, you know, I mean, it, Balboa stadium was crowded Friday and Saturday nights. It was full. It was not just the middle stands, the ones on the sides too. It was people love football. Down nights there. Too. We had Thursday yeah. night football as well. Yeah. Yeah. We yeah, had Jamie Vince, Vince yes. Martinez. Vince yeah. Martinez passed, okay? Of course. I couldn't be the head coach because I was principal, you know. And uh, But now and then I'd go out and help him. But, uh, but the, uh, it, made it, it made it fair. It made, it made it good. There was more kids playing. And it, it made it uh, a lot better for, for the community. And yeah. uh, uh, I think it was a good move, uh, and we we had a lot more kids playing now. Yes, and sure, it made a big difference. So, and coach, now, uh, sorry, sorry, go guys. Ahead, we, we got a, a, a an email from Coach Sweet, and he detailed kind of the history of football, and uh, um, 
It looks like football started in uh, the in Panama around 1911. And, uh, oh, sorry, 1937, and like Coach was saying, it was all touch football. And then um, in 1953 or 51, I mean, you guys weren't there yet, but back then, 51, a stateside team came to Panama and played our Bobo High School team. Right. So from back then, they were coming in. So then... They didn't have enough teams. And in 1953, this is going back to what you guys were talking about, the, the draft, and, and bringing in more players. In 1953, they brought in uh, the Athletic Athletic Club, right. which, 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 com, uh, which was a combination of third-year college students and all the guys that didn't make the cut on the Bible High School team. Right. So that was kind of like a combination of college and ninth and tenth graders. And then they made a team out of out of that combination back in the in the sixties. Oh, from wait, nineteen fifty, yeah, nineteen fifty three, wait, nineteen sixty. Hello. In nineteen sixty is when uh, uh, they they brought that team together. You guys remember any of that or know any of that history? Yes, uh, I. Uh, Fred probably does, but I yeah. I, I, I came in nineteen seventy, and. Uh, Mm, that's right. That's right. You came down from Texas. Well, the reason I know it is because that was part of the stuff that we compiled when we were closing. And <laughs> I relied on, on Coach Sweeney quite a bit, but I was at that time the athletic director at Babel High School, and I, I was blessed to have a 20-hour-a-week secretary, and so she put a lot of stuff on, uh, you know, a lot of stuff, uh, digitized and got a lot of stuff down. And I've got boxes of that stuff that I need to get to probably the museum. Yes, there in Florida, at the University of Florida, I've got our I've, I've got minutes from our athletic department meetings. I've got our, our schedules. I've got the, the scores of the games. I've got the history because in the last year of football, which was the 98 season, every every home game I was producing because I had this I had the help in the athletic program. I had the office up on the second floor of the old wooden gym. I was producing a three or four page program of the team, you know, on double header nights that had all the teams in there and a title page, but there was also a page of history, uh, just in that last wow. year to, to bring back the, those sure. dates, 1953 date, the, the, the athletic, all that stuff is there. And, um, so I, I can, uh, and as I was telling Will yesterday, I've got boxes of uh, VHS tapes from our games that I need to get digitized and get to the museum also. I, I, I went to the, 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 the University of Florida, the, the Panama Canal Museum website, Melanie did the other night, and we were looking. They've got digitized copies of yearbooks. Yes. So I'm sure they can put digitized copies of uh, VHS film clips. Absolutely. Football. Yeah. And that would be a great place for that repository. So, I mean, I can't tell you how many former players have sent me texts and emails before there were texts uh, hey coach you got any film you know of our, our right oh, that'd be great stuff. if you can get that art, art yeah and, and last year i talked to guy nakio he was uh, involved with the kiwanis organization quite a bit and uh -huh. he also you, you, he went to bhs and and so he knew quite a bit of that history and then he talked about how how little league football initially was just a heavyweight division and it was actually initially started as a jv for all the players that didn't make the high school team to give them some playing time and then it just kind of grew into its own league from there so you know there there is that that intertwining of the, the high school program and it eventually morphed into the little league program which then of course you know would feed the high school program anyway right but, uh, yeah, well we did clinics uh kenny i did some I, ernie probably did some i did some uh saturday morning some of the panamanian junior uh junior uh youth football league coaches would come in for a couple hours in, in the office up there in the gym. And I talked to him mostly about how to, how to run a football program and how to discipline a team and, you know, just some of the basics of uh, offense. Sure. And defense. But um, there were a lot of people that were helping to build that basis, which amazingly continues. And there's football in Balboa stadium till this day, you know, and that's, amazing. Uh, that's incredible. Very, various age groups. And, and it's even international now coach uh, Jim Nam is, Asking a question, Jim yep. Knopf is one of the stalwarts of. Uh, we had a four-year run of championships: 89, 90, 91, 92, 
Jim Nam was a big part of that success. He was the only guy in my 40 plus years of coaching that uh, he like broke his wrist or something. He was our center. And uh, he came off the field and, the, and the, there's, we had a doc over there. Hey, you can't play anymore. He's da -da -da. I sat him down on the bench and we were on defense and then we get the ball back on offense and he almost knocked me down running back on the field. <laughs> and I looked at his damn arm and he had his wrist taped up with electrical tape <laughs> like that. And I Such said, a Zonian. I, yeah. I said, get back over here. Coach Grade was coaching with me there. We said, get over, get back. And it was his right hand. He was our center. So in typical, in typical Jim Nam fashion, he said, he yells over his shoulder pad, I'm going to snap with my left hand. <laughs> right on, yeah. Jim. Problem solved. Yeah. Now, to Jim, so he's <clears> asking, <throat> could you speak to how the football season was during the lead-up to Operation Just Cause in 1989? And Coach Holland will remember, I think, well, because the championship <laughs> game was at that right up there in 89. The 89 championship game had to be moved for security concerns because Belleville High School, after the Canal Zone went away, was just, it was in Panama City for all intents and purposes. Right. I don't, there wasn't even a fence around it at that time, I don't think. That came later. So the command insisted that we move the football game to Fort Clayton. And it, and it was like, a, of course, you know, in typical fashion, it was like Friday morning we find out that the championship. Yeah, of there. course. I played in that game, Fred. I played in that game. I ended up uh, as quarterback. I ended up losing that championship. We played well, in the it was, field. Yeah, I was going to say it was, a, it was one of the classic Cougar Bulldog games. Yeah. And we, we were fortunate to win. It was an absolute mud bath. That's probably the worst field I've ever – coach the game on it was a flag football field it was yes. lines of flag football and they kind of made some sketchy lines to approximate a high school or a, or a regulation field and we teed it up and kicked it off and um, it took us two hours to get out there they were doing the mirror checks under the cars and everything we ended up winning i think the final score was something like 18 14 uh ryan coon was uh was a was a, a great play he was our tight end and we ran them a lot, you know. In those days, most tight ends were on the on the on the had their hand on the ground, and it was traditional. But I would stand him up and use him to run the ball inside and stuff. I mean, he was a very versatile athlete, big, tall, had come from the states, had been coached, and on the like one of the Bulldogs' great linebackers whacked the crap out of him on our first offensive possession, and he came off the field, and his shoulder was somewhere down around his belt buckle. Oh no. The doc goes, he's separated his shoulder. And that was another kid. He, he walked over to me and he said, there's no way in hell I'm coming out of this game. This was like That's five minutes. Those were some good games, I tell you. He, uh, he goes, this so like five minutes things, the first well, quarter. I'm so not, I go to the, the bleachers behind me. His parents were sitting there. I walked over and said, Ryan's shoulder is separated. One of the things, I want, to, one of the things I want to bring out is uh, Kenny Anderson. Yes, uh, absolutely. He was a coach, and then uh, uh, he became um, what my assistant principal. And uh, he was tremendous, tremendous assistant principal. And when we went to the college, I'm, I brought him over there also. But I went to visit him in, in Puerto Rico. We had a good time. And uh, when he got sick, I called him and talked to him. And then uh, the, the, the day before he died, uh, I had a very long talk with him. And he, he was remembering a lot of the things that we, we've done. He had a problem with prostate cancer, and he had it for a long time. And uh, he was lucky that he, he lived that long with that, with that cancer. But he was a great coach. He was very technical. And he helped. Uh, uh, he helped a lot of the coaches, especially Fred. He helped him, and uh, and I had him as assistant principal, and I, I really miss him. The same thing with Vince Martinez. Yes. Vince Martin Martinez was a, was a spark plug. Yes. Yeah. He was. Uh, he was a coach when I played coach. He was a. Uh, yeah. uh, he had gone to Oklahoma. He was an Oklahoma, uh, fan, and and, but he was. He was a he was a great person also, and uh, 
those are the ones that we have lost. I really don't know of any of the other coaches. Fred, you may remember some of the others, but uh, but those are some of the coaches that, that sure. we have. McGee, Coach McGee was also sure. with us. He's yeah, still, but he's, yeah, he's still with us. He he's was going to try and join us. John was going to try and get him on, uh, yeah, but uh, we were having was, some issues there. McGee was, uh, was, uh, was very special. He was very my special. defensive assistant coach. Mm-hmm. We we brought uh, like Fred. We brought uh, you know Cristobal ran a a five three and they would never get out of the five three. Right. And, and, and I and, and I said uh, I talked to Fred. I said Fred, five three is easy to block, and uh, all you have to do is pull a guard from the other side or a tackle from the other side, and you got it made. <laughs> but uh, Lint was a good coach. But he never got out of that five three, and right. after after that, you know, he beat him. We beat him a lot. But he, he wouldn't get out of it, and right. that's uh, you got to change. And that's why I, I told would tell the coaches and Fred, go to see what's happening in the states, and uh, we we ran a, a four three numbers, and uh, yeah. we, we would change people around all over the place, right. And, uh, so you got to do that. You got to change with the, with the with the current. There was a, there were a lot of uh, similarities in the, the Bulldogs four three numbers defense and the Red Machine six yeah. two uh, numbers defense, which Kenny that was the first defense I learned. And um, but I remember to your point of changing, Coach, and I always took your your advice. So one year I was in the states and I started look because of the personnel I knew we had coming back. I started looking at a three four defense, right. which is essentially an NFL style defense. Yes. We put the the we, we we would walk the 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 Sam linebacker down on the tight end heart you know right. hard on the tight end some, but it looked it, it it was a hybrid thing. Coach Al Grade was with me then, and we developed it together. Right. And Coach Ernie Holland sat in the stands and took Polaroids of every snap of the ball. To see. <laughs> I'm looking at it, the coach right there that did that. He had a stack of Polaroids of every snap that we ran on defense when he scouted us when we went to the three four because it caused his blocking schemes a lot of problems right. and one reason was personnel we had a middle guard type player who you know you can't play a defense like that unless you have a dominant one technique or zero technique player right right right, right? and we had a kid named Jermaine per year Jermaine per year we had some weight weight room incentive shirts and he was a four he was a 350 pound bench guy and a 450 pound squat wow. guy and he could he would tackle the the veer and stuff down the line of scrimmage from behind he played nose guard like a mike linebacker so when yeah. you got a guy like that that's why i went to that defense because and and, and and let me tell you a little story about that coach and since you're talking about the championship in clayton because i know that i played against that defense and that's what eventually kicked uh, the Veer offense off the books of the Bulldogs was uh, Buff. You know, the, uh, you call him Jermaine, we call him Buff because his responsibility, like you called it, everyone else got everyone else and Buff picked me off. So the defense got the, the, the dive back and then the other guy got the, the other defensive player got the pitch back and I ended up eating it with, with, uh, with Buff every play, keeping the ball because everyone else was covered. And that's how you ended up beating us a tight game, but it was tough because yeah. everyone was taken. And yes. uh, uh, because normally someone's always open, but right. uh, making that hybrid defense took away the quarterback, which was me. So every, you covered everyone else and I was the, left, the man left over, but Buff took care of me. So basically that controlled that offense. It was a tight game at the end of the day because it was sloppy and muddy. Oh but, yeah. Uh, like you said, you made the changes uh, that, that were needed to stop that offense. And uh, eventually the Bulldogs switched offenses after that. Yeah. Right. Well, Listen, and I ran the beer with coach. Talking about Ricky Royal. He had girls following him all over the place. <laughs> <laughs> I, was the, I was the senior quarterback for the Bulldogs. I had uh, who my girlfriend was that? Lisa Adams. She what was I, a pretty one. I, what I told him, I said, if I make you quarterback, all these girls, cheerleaders, they're going to be following you all over the place. Yes, I don't coach. want you to tell them that you're going to be quarterback because they're going to be all over you. And, and of course, you didn't listen to me. 
And, well, uh, yeah, like I was, it wasn't my fault, Coach. They, the, the girls, you're, you're all right. They, uh, they're, they're persistent. Here, Coach, <laughs> Coach Holland, to your point about Kenny Anderson, I want to say one other thing. Of course, he, he and I became like brothers, and we stayed. He was Josh, our son Joshua, who we're visiting here with uh, his wife and our new grandchild. He, Kenny is Joshua's godfather, and we were when. Uh, we were, of course, we were still here in Okinawa teaching and uh, when Kenny passed away in 2020. Uh, and uh, it was COVID was just starting. But we had been in Hokkaido, a snow festival, up way up north in Japan for a big ice festival for about a week. We took leave. We went up there, Melanie and I, on a little mid-year vacation. We came back home. And just a couple of nights later, the phone rang. And I think I can't remember. Melanie would remember. I can't remember if it was Eva or Ashley. Probably Eva Anderson called us and said look dad's in hospice in the villages um if you you know just letting you know and of course melanie and i said right away we're getting on a plane in the morning uh joshua was sitting at the dining table with us and he said he was already back from college and he was on my coaching staff and uh, he was working here he said i'm i'm buying a ticket i'm going to and our son caleb took leave from his he, he's a trucker a big rig guy he took leave and came down to the villages. We all arrived there uh, I February 21st or 22nd, 2020, and got picked up at the little hotel there in the villages. There's a little Marriott, and uh, we got there in the middle of the night, and our friend picked us up and drove us at the hotel and drove us straight to the hospice. It was a beautiful hospice facility in the villages, and we went into the room, and it was about 1 in the morning. Big room, beautiful room. Kenny was, of course, in the bed. And he was heavily, you know, morphine, the whole deal. And I walked over and leaned over the bed and his eyes opened and he said, I've been waiting for you. Oh, that's awesome. <laughs> and, and then we stayed through his passing. Uh, of course, Ashley was there. Eva was there. Uh, we, 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 went, we went out to dinner every night and cried in our beer and, and told great Coach Anderson stories. And they told their dad stories and we laughed and we cried and, hugged one another and got the funeral mass planned at the really St. Timothy's there in the villages. And so we, and then he passed away. We got a call about two in the morning at our, our hotel room and said that the, the hospice people said, come now he's, he's, he's moving on. So we went over there for his last few minutes really. But I was in the room coach and there was a ping ding going on in his hospice room. It was a big room, had couches, potted palm trees, a lanai, you could have 15, 18 people in there, no problem. We were blasting. Us. Kenny loved the the, the, Latin, the Panamanian music, the Lucho stuff, all, all the ping ding music. We were blasting that stuff, and he would be in and out of his his state with his drugs. But he would smile every time he, he opened his eyes because people were there. The people that lived in Central Florida were coming through there like it was a reunion. And Johnny Hearn and a bunch of guys that played ball, baseball for us, football, and, and that whole crew of Central Florida people were there every other day they were in and out for about a two week period, 10 days maybe before he really uh, passed away. But when I was in the room and I was there for many hours each day, I was on the cell phone. I was waiting for the calls to come in, the people that want to talk to coach to say goodbye. And I was there when you called coach, I was, I was there standing next to his bed when you called and talked to him. Wow. Yeah. Coach Hoffman. Going yeah. back to Ricky, Ricky, man, those girls, I tell you, uh, did, you, did you ever get together and marry one of them? You know, Coach, I I, uh, I I was married for three years. That's it. I've been a bachelor my, I whole, my, my whole entire life. life. But coach, I'm ready. I'm ready to get married now. I'm 60. I, I think I, I, I finally I'm ready. <laughs> so any girls out there, Coach, will, will, will vouch for me, you know? Yeah, R Ricky and Johnny you know, McGee are, are, are yeah, competing you know, for the you know, world's oldest bachelor. Yeah, no, I've had a good, I have had a good life, Coach. I've uh, done a lot of architecture work, and I've done any a lot of kids? construction management. You have, you have any kids? No kids. No, I didn't, I never had kids. I uh, yeah, I don't nothing. Know none he'll claim. What are, that I, do, no. what are you gonna do with your legacy, man? You, well, you know, uh, hopefully leave it to when you go, everything's gone. When I go, yeah. I have eight grandkids. You got eight grandkids. Well, well you one, know, and one great grandkid. Nice. I will have to check. No, I don't know, Coach. I tried. I tried. I really did, Coach. But uh, well, maybe one of those hits that uh, 
uh, one of those Cristobal kids hit dead to you, it ruined you for life. <laughs> yes, but even the Cristobal girls liked me back then too. So it was uh, it was good being a quarterback because you do get a lot of girlfriends. But uh, other than that, I got to play one year of football up here, Coach. Um, I don't know if you guys knew about it, but I, I played in the in the California Junior Varsity Junior College League. Oh, good. I don't, I don't know if you guys are familiar, but you know. California Junior College is uh, pretty competitive. I mean, there's about eight Hall of Famers. I, I write this all up uh, uh, out of the junior college uh, football that we got here. They play real good ball. Man. Yeah, they did. I got some pictures that I brought. Uh, and uh, are you they married did, uh, a California girl? You know, um, no, I actually married a Panamanian girl. Coach, one of your uh, a Shemansky, whose brother was one of your better football players. Yeah. Rick Shemansky's daughter, I mean sister Patricia. Rick, yeah, so Rick was a. You're gonna have you, you're gonna get have good offspring, but you can't wait too long. All right, <laughs> Coach, I'm a little, it's a little late for me now, but uh, a little late. What's wrong with you? I thought, <laughs> one of the girls that I did date had a son, and I taught him everything about football, and he quarterbacked, and and so I, I had that experience. That's the best I had. And then I also, if Coach Bill, I don't know if you remember, but I coached one year in Puerto Rico. Uh, I think it was like 96, 97 when you guys were going up to Puerto Rico to play them. Right. Uh, yeah. So I would watch the games with you guys. Uh, Houston and I would coach from the, I mean, from the, from behind the, 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 the goalpost. We were back there and you guys would have us scope out their defense. Right, I don't know if you exactly. remember this. And then Houston saw that their cornerbacks were really small and weak. So yeah. you guys just kept attacking, 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 attacking the corners. Well, and we you took, guys Yeah, we took some great teams over there. We had uh, Oh yeah. In those years, and of course uh, Ernie Senior will remember, but for the last 4 years of Balboa High School, we had games with Puerto Rico. Yeah. And right. we would play those games as Balboa High School Bulldogs. We we ordered new uniforms, red and white. Balboa High School Bulldogs, and we would go. They would come and play us in Balboa Stadium in September. We would have the general come down, do the coin toss, big crowd. Yeah. And Steve yep. Wideline was was the counterpoint athletic director and head football coach at Antilles High School. Had a great football program. <clears throat> we played those guys like eight times, and we won four, and they won four. They were very good. Yeah. And of yeah. course, by that time, that time came around. The college kids were gone. They were in the JUCO league. We didn't have any more. Uh, PCC kids on our team. So it was high school kids against high school kids. And we had people wanted to call it an all-star team, but I always called it the varsity team from Babel High School because all of our players were from Babel High School and they were, you know, that was our best players when we put them together. The best players I, from the Cougars. I thought that Willie was going to be a lawyer. You couldn't beat him <laughs> on any any talking. <laughs> he is... He would bring these stories, and shoot, I, I feel sorry for him. But he was lying. <laughs> he, he, he was a talker, and well, he's still talking. <laughs> yeah, the gift of gab. What are you going to tell you? Know, you you have the gift of gab. You got to make it work. Hey, coach, I can do it. I can do it. I can do it. And shit, he'd get run over. <laughs> right, but but I did, but I did take over the. Uh, Long snapping duties. That what I did. And you're like, no, you can't do that. I was like, come on, coach, watch. Just one time. And and sure enough, I did. And I beat out Kevin Anderson, who was a great long snapper. Right. But um, yeah. Yeah, I, I had learned that from, from my brother because my brother played center his whole life. And even before I started playing football, you know, he was always teaching me how to long snap. So. I think you're, you're, you were a good salesman. That's, that's what you were. I was, I, I and, and to this day, I'm actually a sales trainer now for as a career. So yes, you're very observant there, coach. <laughs> but I will say this: this is an interesting story, and I don't think I was ever caught doing this. But um, my number was 44, right. and as a center, there's a couple times where I got away with catching a ball in the end zone. Um, it was both times it was my fault because of the bad snap. But I, I snapped the ball, and I'm waiting that second and a half, two seconds to hear the boom of the ball being kicked. Didn't get kicked. I look back, and then Julio Frausto's picking up the ball scrambling. I just run in the end zone. He throws the ball, touched out, nobody said a word, and then nobody ever realized that it was the center that, that <laughs> went downfield to catch it. So was, I was like, okay, well, I'll just be quiet. That was a big point in life, I tell you. Yeah, absolutely. So yeah. we'll take him any way we could that back then. But uh, no, it was good. It was uh, 
Uh, I'm actually, believe it or not, I, I got a message from Coach Houston. He's going to try and jump on. He's he's kind of out of pocket a little bit, but he's, he's on his cell phone now, and I just sent him the link. So hopefully if he, he might be joining us here in, in just a moment, hopefully. But uh, okay. I'll, I'll stay a few more minutes, but we got it's daytime here in Japan, and we've got a, a family, little family uh, outing planned today. So. Uh, oh, I got you. Right on. Well, and, and of course, we've got plenty of room to do more of this. Uh, and, and Coach Holland, I was talking to Coach Bales last night about doing something as we get closer to the football season uh, where we'll take one of our teams and invite a couple of people on that played on that team to join us and uh, talk about that season. And by the way, real quick, guys, I've got another guest joining us here, none other than uh, Coach Louis Houston. Welcome, Coach. Hey, it's good to be here. Coach. Coach, saludos. <laughs> saludos, Coach. Saludos. What's the deal? What's the deal with a white hair around the mouth? That looks great. Fred had <laughs> one. Also, yes. It, yes, I it, it makes you look I older, face Coach. Face everybody every day. You know, <laughs> it's a sophisticated retired, look. You don't have to face everyone every day. <laughs> right on. Right on. Coach, how you doing? We've been talking some uh, some high school memories and stuff, and uh, glad you were able to join us here. Um, oh, I'm thrilled to be here. Great, great. It was great to have you. Yeah, yeah. We were just going to talk a little bit about uh, – we talked about the draft and, and how we switched over from, you know, the college team obviously being the all-star team in essence, and then, of course, they – they went over to a draft where now you've got to choose different, you know, everybody has the teams, even the teams up and whatnot. And I was going to ask uh, the two coaches now, and now that you're here, I'll ask all three of you guys. Prior to that draft, you kind of knew who you were going to get on your team. So you, you, I guess you almost had to build your, your team and your strategy around what you were getting, whereas now you're going to the draft. Was it a different thought process? Because, again, now you're getting players that, you can pick, right? You can handpick them based on your situation. So how, how did that change the way you looked at, 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 at us, us players on the Rams, for example, You know, now that you were going to have a chance to maybe draft them versus, so I'm not going to get them because they don't have the right last name. <laughs> it was just, you know, it, it changed things a lot. You, you kind of get set in your ways and doing things, and all of a sudden you're faced with new challenges, and that it was a challenge. But I'll tell you what, it, it seemed to work pretty well. It seemed to work. Yeah, we were yeah. talking about how it, it made it more competitive, I think, you know, and, and everybody had, you know, especially like Coach Bales mentioned, so now you guys are really uh, JUCO coaches, you know, the junior colleges, it, everybody had some of those players on your team, and so you, you kind of built a different team and maybe with a different strategy. It had to be because, you know, you're dealing with different type kids, and when you've been dealing with them for a long time, like we were at the college, and all of a sudden you've got – sophomores and freshmen to deal with it it changes the venue man i'll bet i'll bet what would you say would be the biggest adjustment for you guys as coaches that you had to make uh kind of like what you're talking about there uh, i tell you what it is fred's team and our team we were always sending the good players to the college and and he didn't have to coach them all he had to do is give him the ball. <laughs> and then, well, then when the draft came in, then he had to work. <laughs> let, me, let me give you a, a comment from J.D. That's a good point, Coach. Regarding that, regarding that, Ernie. He said, you know, Coach, J.D. Bryant, did you just here. mention the, the legendary J.D. Bryant's name? The legendary. Yeah. J.D. Bryant, yeah. yeah. I remember Coach Bryant. There was two it's of them, Coach. Thing. It was J.D. Bryant and somebody else. Moffitt. A blonde, a a Moffitt, yeah, Moffitt. That's correct. You got him right. But he made a comment. Crazy dudes. He made a comment. You have he said, "Crazy coaches." <laughs> well, it's true. JD said, "Coach, it's a good thing it's you and I are here, because if it were anybody else, there would be a lot of damaged players on that field, and it wouldn't be any of ours." Because it was, <laughs> hey, when you got guys like Mark Robinson and Corby Fearon running around with helmets on. Um, it changes yeah. the scenario. It really does. I was on that team, Coach, when, when we just crushed everybody <laughs> with Corby Fear on. Yeah, I was on that team. Yeah, well, you were already trained. Well, that's it. I was already yeah, trained, was... right. And uh, so, like like you, Holland, Houston had me running back. Well, first he had me at quarterback. 
But then LG Richards came like late, and it was a tall, tall guy that can throw yes, 70 yards on a rope. So you go, Royal, you're going to play running back this week. <laughs> Next week, Royal, you're going to play flanker. The week after that, Royal, you're going to play safety, cornerback. Those are the four positions I played for you that, that year. Well, you were all over the field. And again, I was all over the you, field. Yeah, I loved it. Hey, so you, here's, here's real quick. Coach Lou, here, here's real quick, quick one. Kenny got sick one week and was in the hospital and he couldn't coach in the game. And I was, I was still, I guess it was our third year in Red Machine. Somebody, somebody uh, commented 10 minutes or 20 minutes ago and asked how many years that I coached uh, with Sweeney and, on the Red Machine, Jim Sweeney. And that was five years, 78 through 82. But we played, we played the college, and I was going to be the de facto defensive coordinator and call the defense for the game. Kenny was in the hospital. I spent Tuesday night, Wednesday night, Thursday night sneaking into the hospital after visiting hours by his bedside, <laughs> building the game plan. The running back that Lou had was Billy Joyce. Yeah, and yeah. And he had a bunch of horses to block for him, and he had a yeah. tremendous defense. We The final score of that game was 7-0, Green Devils. The, that was my first game I ever called defense. And we held Billy Joyce and the Green Devil machine offense to a touchdown, and they scored on one they drew in the dirt in the fourth quarter. <laughs> Whatever it takes. Whatever it takes. Saturday morning, we have a coaches, coaching staff meeting. I, I, I spent a, I, most of the night getting the analytics from the game. You guys snapped the ball like 70 times in, a, in a, essentially a wow. high school football game. And we gave up seven points to that juggernaut team you had. And I went in the next day, and the coaches are looking at me like the defense cost us the game. <laughs> it was like, I just said, you guys are smoking. I don't know what. But I put but, it on the table. I you said, know what the how, that, that is. Don't you? Look how many snaps they had. And the, the play that beat us, they drew it in the dirt. And Billy Joyce leaked out of the backfield. It was like a leak play, like his run today. Motion away. He hit up in there for a minute. Then he leaked out into the weak side flat over toward the boundary. Over on the center where the track crossed that corner of the end zone down there the, at the 10-yard. Yes. He's kind of hiding in the dark over there. And you threw him. A, we didn't have a defender within 20 yards of him. And he caught it and walked into the end zone. That was it. That was a great story. You know, regarding your coach's meeting, remember the adage, it's not whether you win or lose. It's, it's who you can blame. And you were there, and you had the defense, so it was your fault. <laughs> By the way, I'll that was, not have a, a shutout. That was a great Ron Bouzier quote. He loved to say that all the time. It's not whether you win or lose, but who you can blame. <laughs> oh, fantastic. <laughs> Bouzier, that's, that's another yeah. <laughs> Louis was a good philosopher. He yes. really would come out with good, good phrases to st stimulate his kids. Yes. I, and, uh, you know, I really appreciated what he did with those kids. Uh, Louis, you were, you were a great coach. And Absolutely. You, he, well, he had to after the when we did the draft. He had to coach <laughs> now. <laughs> but, that was, but that was good. But he, his assistant coaches were... Well, interesting. I, 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 there's no definition for that, but, but <laughs> Louis. Well, the definition will do it on the after show. You you uh, kept them, you kept them in line, probably the, in the in the lounge. That was a challenge. Great guys. Yeah, oh. <laughs> both of them great guys. But you know, like, so let me ask you guys. So so coaching. Tell me one time because now you mentioned it now how they scored on that play that they kind of drew in the dirt. Is that something you guys ever found yourself where you're like, nothing in this playbook is working? Let me figure something out. Reason play, I say that, I play, I, play, I I was coaching one year uh, up here, and we had a scrimmage against a team, and they just absolutely whipped our asses. We could not move the ball one inch. And I'm racking my brain trying to figure out, okay, what are we going to do? This is going to be a long season if we don't figure something out. And I remember sitting up at 3 o'clock in the morning, and my wife's like, what's the matter? And I was like, Nothing. Sorry. I got up, walked to the kitchen table, took out a piece of paper, and I started drawing up an offense. It just came to my mind in the middle of the night, and I was like, okay, this is going to work. And, and it, fortunately, it did work, but if you guys ever find yourselves in that situation where you're like, okay, we just got to throw these playbooks out of the way and figure something out here. And, and, and what did you do, and how did that come about? 
Well, briefly, I'll just speak to that. Later in my coaching career, I learned how to turn control over at the line of scrimmage to quarterbacks. Um, and that's that's essentially what you're saying. But it was organized by the time I figured out how to do it. I, in the late 80s, we started doing a lot of that. I, I got into a one-back situation that I, you know, um, I can still remember one night that uh, Coach Ellis screamed across. There's a screaming at his defense. There's only one running back. Why can't you tackle him? <laughs> we, we had a great Lance Von Holland, or as we called him, Van Halen. Lance Van Halen. <laughs> was a stud running back. We played a one back with him so we could go four wides. And that created a lot of, that reduced the number of the defense out. It vacated yeah. the box and we would put sure. a 205 pound one back up in that box for big yards. And, um, but yeah, so it kind of gets to your point. I mean, at, a, at that level of ball we were coaching, you know, if you could train your quarterback to look and see what's there and what's not. And then just get, we had a check with me system at the line of scrimmage, even in the late eighties, when we, we had a really strong run late eighties into the mid nineties. And uh, my quarterbacks were calling a lot of it. I would call the blocking scheme like base check with me. Right. So it's base block. We're going to run the ball with our, with our one back, but we're going to decide where we're crossing the line of scrimmage based on how the defense lines up. And they would just communicate that at the line of scrimmage and, we were base blocking anyway. It didn't change anything for the O line. We just sure. put half. And, but we Let would run improvise. The ball. We would Louis, run the how, ball. how many grandkids you got? Who me? Louis, Louis, yeah, Coach Louis. Six. Six. Hey. Right on. So you got a good legacy, not yes. like Ricky. Yeah. <laughs> cats, cats. I'm gonna have cats. I'm gonna, I'm gonna get some cats. He either, he either got. Uh, hit in the place you're not supposed to get hit when you when he was playing with you, or he did it when I was playing with me. Yeah, but yeah. there's nobody there. Way, <laughs> good gun either way. Well, I got my first grandkid on the way here in about four weeks, so my legacy is still going to move on. Yeah, yeah Man, we're goes. blessed with three at Another this point. Caleb has two. Caleb thank and his wife. Caleb and Joshua. Good legacy. Man. Good legacy. That's what what I'm do. World. Yeah. Sure. So, Coach Houston, what about you? What, what, where did you situation like, like Coach Bales is saying that you found it you had to improvise something, or, or you know, I'm a control freak, so I would be hard for me to, to kind of let the quarterbacks call and stuff. But I guess that's the modern game. Well, you know, we we would do what we would do in practice, and that was I'd let the quarterback, whoever it was, and sometimes it wasn't a very good call that I made when I just do what you feel you need to do because you're, you're the one with the f your, your foot on the field and right. you know, who's around you, you know, who your players are. So don't go crazy. You know, when you mentioned, um, Rue, Johnny Rue played for me. It, um, okay. Yes, that's right. Yeah. And I was down in Panama a few years ago and we went to the, th this is a good story. We went to Rio Mar. I was with my wife. I saw there was one tower that then drew. I said, you know what? Let's go to Rio Mar and see what they're doing there. I hadn't been there in umpteen years. So we drove and drove up and there was a gate there. And the guy says, y que quieren? Bueno, queremos, because they were still selling. Um, queremos ver si estamos interesados. Okay. So he let us in. He says, go to the front office right there and talk to a lady. We talked to the lady and she called the one guy that was head of everything. He, he showed us around, took us up to the eight. They only had one, one tower there, 18 floors. He showed us around the area. He took us to the 18th floor. It was incredible view. You'd see waves coming in from like a mile out. You'd see them. Wow. Start. It was just beautiful. So I asked him, I said, ¿Y, y quiénes son los, los que están organizando esto? Ah, um, Moses y Ru, los hermanos Ru. I said, hermano Ru, como Johnny. He says, sí, sí, Johnny. Usted conoce a Johnny. Sí, sí, lo conozco muy bien. He says, um, déjeme llamarle. E espera un momentito. No, no lo llame. Porque dice, él nunca llega acá. Nunca. Él se queda en, en la ciudad. <laughs> Siempre. Pero vamos a hacer esto. Tú y yo vamos a ir mañana a la oficina. Pero no le vamos a decir... We're not going to let them know who's coming. 
So I said, okay, that sounds good. So he calls him. We're up there, up on the 18th floor. And he says, Johnny, I tengo un cliente to have a client here that's interested in, in some of the property. He, he says, um, well, no, have him come by tomorrow. He says, we'll be by tomorrow. He says, okay, we'll see you then. He, he didn't tell him who it was. The next day I went to the, to, on 50th Street, I think is what the, where their office was. But um, the, the guy told me, he said, come to my office first. So I did. I went to his office and we talked for about maybe 30 minutes, my wife, Robin, and I. And he's sitting in his office. And then he says, um, let me call Johnny. He gets on the intercom. He says, Johnny, aquí tengo a cliente que quiere hablar contigo. Yeah, you know, I've got the client here that wants to speak with you. He says, um, mira, Pablo, estoy muy ocupado. No, no, dígale que no puedo, no puedo asistirlo ahí. He, I, I can't do it because I'm too busy. Um, no, no, uh, Johnny, usted no entiende. Este es un, un cliente importante que quiere hablar contigo. I, no, look, man, I, he says, he tells me, tells him in Spanish, because yeah, I could hear it on the intercom. He says, look, I'm sorry, I can't do it. He says, tell him to come by tomorrow. He says, well, he's leaving back to the States tomorrow. He can't come. So, okay. Um, maybe, maybe you can call your meeting some other time and come and see this client. He says, I'm, he started getting angry. Estoy diciendo que no puedo go on you, you know. So, <laughs> really ticked off. So he says, Mira, Johnny, te voy a decir, el coche usted, puta. He gives me a big hug. And I said, Wait, 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 Johnny, wait, wait. Let's talk about important things first. Split right, slot right, 42 counter on two. A, a split right, a slow right. Uh, I say, see, you still can't call the damn place, can you? <laughs> <laughs> the guys were like, coach, I can't understand them. Johnny, tiene que hablar mejor. You know, he, right. he deal with it. But that, he didn't, he didn't let that go. He says, coach, I tried. I tried as best I could. But <laughs> all right, a slow right, is that good? Is that good enough? Because apparently, if we went a slow right, we ran somewhere. So it did it did off all the time but that was a funny funny reunion we had he did well, not he, even then at that point he couldn't say split right slot right 42 counter on two he would get all tongue-tied but a nice kid real nice uh, kid well, yeah johnny was a good kid very competitive too oh he, yeah uh, oh yeah he was tough i always remember our shrine bowl game against them uh when i was on rams and uh we had fumbled the ball. I was playing running back, and we fumbled. He was the defensive end. He picked the ball up, and I was, I mean, about to grab him and bring him down, and Renee Richards grabs my shoulder pads to get leverage and ends up pulling me off and then falling over me, and Johnny runs down the field touchdown. I yeah. turned to Renee. I was like, oh, I, I mean, I had him right there, and he was gone. And let me tell you what, Johnny was deceptively fast. He didn't look fast, but when he got going, he could move, man. He was – they were good quarterbacks. That Roots family were very, very, uh, whole very family. talented. Yeah, that whole family. I think the older brother started with the the Kiwanis heavyweights. I, I think he might have been maybe a year or two after they started, but his older brother, I mean, there was like Roberto, Ricardo, Romulo, and Johnny. Yeah. Ernie, Listen, you would have more knowledge about those guys. Let me just uh, interject, if I may. I'm going to have to take off. It's it's so great to see you guys. And uh, Thank you, Coach. We want to get back to it, and I just want to say thanks, uh, Will and, and Ricky, for this thing you're doing. It's really cool, really great. It is, I, it is really something. I know you'll. Hey uh, guys, I know it's going to evolve, and and uh, we we'll look forward to seeing you guys at the reunion. I know you'll be there, Coach yeah. Holland. Coach Holland, Melanie and I have a plan. We're planning three weeks in Panama next January, so let's get together and talk some ball. And I want to see what you guys are doing, and and uh, we can. We can spend some time together then. All right. Okay. Yeah. yeah there's going to be a lot of football players this year for the Ram reunion. So it's going to yeah. be a lot of guys there. And I'll see Coach yep. Lou. I'll see Coach Lou and Robin. And, uh, yeah, yeah we'll see you guys at the reunion. Hey, you know, now you're talking about that. I'm um, just a little bit aside here. That program you guys put on last year was incredible. It was incredible. Well, thank you. I've seen you guys on stage and doing all kinds of stuff, but that was that was stellar. That was stellar. 
Well, Mel, look, Melanie just chimed in. She says, uh, Will, I think your reunion pool party is wrong. Melanie, Coach Lou's just giving you some kudos there uh, for the show at the, at the reunion last summer. Um, <laughs> Melanie, Melanie directed it. She put the cast together from far and wide, and uh, we rehearsed for 40-plus hours from Monday to Saturday, 1 p.m. when we did the show there at the hotel. As people flew in, Melanie's a tough coach. She told them we did Zoom practices for about four or five weeks. She mailed out all the music all over the world to the cast members. Your sister was our choreographer, as you yeah. well know. And she was. You got a lot of big, great reviews on that. I mean, that yeah. people talked about that for a long time after the reunion. Right. L Linda was sending us uh, choreography clips, and we were stumbling around trying to learn all that. And then, then of course, we, we got to the Rose and Shingle Creek on the Monday set up the rehearsal room. We didn't, Melanie was like, it's the head coach, she told us there that first team meeting we had, look, you're not here to go to the reunion, you're here to rehearse. Ah, uh, right on. We're gonna be living, we're gonna eat and sleep and rehearse, and we did. I That's think it great. was tracking the hours, I think it was 43 and a half hours of rehearsal time from Monday well, to Saturday at 1 p.m. to put that together. And it came out fantastic. So well done. And and I, I learned something tonight about, you know, the whole coaching philosophy. And you always it's not about winning or losing, but who you can blame. And I gotta blame Ricky on that one because he's the one that put that that date on it. That wasn't me. So um, so thanks, coaches, for allowing me a tool that I can use now to push that on somebody else now. So <laughs> there you go. That was never that was never my philosophy. That was uh, you know. It happened. Well, whoever I took it, I took it, and I applied it right away. So you see, it's it something that I learned, and within minutes, I applied what I learned. <laughs> God bless you guys and uh, your family. Thank you, Coach. We appreciate it. You know, the history is very valuable to all of us, and we had a great, great participation. A lot of football players on tonight. Well, yeah, well, we're not done yet. We're just Coach Bales has to run because he's got, you know, remember, it's Saturday morning over there. He's on the other side of the world, so. Right. Um, it's 11, it's 11, 20, uh, 11, 20 a.m. here Saturday. That's awesome. So it's ready for lunchtime for you guys. But yeah. Coach, thanks Robin, again for joining us. And uh, when Robin, you get back in the States, reach out to me. Abrazos, Robin. I see you there. Abrazos. I see your beautiful hey, face. There you go. Thank <laughs> you. There, right, there, right there is the secret to Coach Houston's uh, success and longevity sitting Listen, right next to him. You <laughs> called it when you said Melanie <laughs> took control. She had <laughs> control. Because if not, it, it wouldn't have worked. And they're, well, you, know, that was, that was you may have been tough with your football players, but um, behind every good man is a great woman. That's what they say. With Melanie, that was another story, man. It was a good hey, that show That's awesome. Fabulous. Good you, Stephen. Thanks for calling in. So for, I'm out. And, before, you leave, before you leave, I want to thank you again for helping me out with that that football game that I almost got fired for. Um, <laughs> <laughs> the the whatever bowl it was. Yeah, but you you helped out a lot with that. Now I want to. That was the night game, and uh, we rode that we rode that horse until it got too old to ride anymore. That horse called, uh, you know, do it and then ask forgiveness later. <laughs> that horse, long name for a horse, but we used to do all kinds of stuff like that. And uh, finally, we of that. That, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Coach Holland, I can't tell you how great it is to see you and spend some time with you, and I look forward to uh, seeing you face to face in Panama in Enero. Okay. Right, Enero. Okay, fine, problem. And also, Eric. Yeah, hey. how you doing, Coach? Yeah, how you doing, Coach? You said. Nintonce, how you doing, bud? Good, good, good. Hey, bien. You look real good. Thanks, thanks. Hey, who's that pretty girl? Pretty girl up next to. Take care, Coach Bale. Yeah. All right, Coach. Uh, hey, Louis, you me. won the lottery with that girl next to you. I, you don't hear me complaining too much. <laughs> right on. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, this is awesome. You no, know, we spent a lot of time at Ernie's house up at that up at that beach there, and um, you know it was just just an incredible opportunity to know Ernie and to you know not just coach against him, but be a real real a good friend of his that he allowed us anytime we were at the beach he allowed us to come into his place there and just we just enjoyed it tremendously yes, we enjoyed yes. it tremendously. 
But that's you know, that's one thing I've noticed about, and this is just in general across the board with all these shows we've been doing. When we bring up zonians of any job, any caliber, anything. It's always a very close knit family, and and no matter what you do, and you guys do your coaching circles, you know, big rivals every Friday night, but afterwards, you know, it, it's the friendship and the closest in that in that whole family atmosphere. And I think that's really unique to the Canal Zone, you know. To and the players too, the players were like that as well. I mean, on the field we kill each other, but after that we, you know, we all hang out like brothers. But you know what? To to piggyback on that. Ernie, you remember the octathlons? The what? The octathlons with the coaches. You were on my team. You, um, Gary Collins. There yeah. were four. Gary Collins. Wow, that's a blast but in the past. First, the first one of the one of the events we had. We would do eight events, but one of the events was golf. I've never golfed in my life, Ernie. Do <laughs> you remember these? Those decathlons. I remember. I remember. I, I walked home. I said, forget this mess. <laughs> I walked back to the car and took off. They they had to teach me how to hold the club. Okay. So we got a, we were playing eight ball, uh, Mexican best ball. And, you know, they told me, okay, go up there and take a swing. So I got up there and shanked. The, you know, they made me go first all the time. So I shanked the first ball. Okay. Fred gets up there and hits a ball. And I said, um, you know, the ball just went and went and went and went. I said, hey, that's a pretty good shot. Kenny Anderson looks at me. He says, good shot. Husty. There aren't a lot of people in the world that can hit a shot like that. <laughs> that I knew what I was in for. So, you know, we went to the first hole, second hole, third hole, fourth hole. And we were playing. I think there were, were there five teams, Ernie? I don't know, but I, I made it to the first hole, and then I walked away. And that was it, man. <laughs> <laughs> and what, what, what course was that? Horoco, Amador? Where are you going? It was Amador. I'll it was you. Amador. <laughs> you know, got, to the, you know, got to the point where the the sinking the putts wasn't too tough. So we go and we play nine holes, and then we come back to the clubhouse and find out that we're tied with um, – um, which team with? Oh, with Riley, Jeff Riley's team. So we had to do a, a playoff. They know we, how to play. Well, we went back to the, back to the court, back to the to the links, and we just kept hitting and kept hitting. And I think they beat us on the, on the fourth hole. So they they won that event. But we're walking back, and Riley tells me he says. Hey, Hussey, I can tell you never played this game before. You know, just stutter. <laughs> I can tell you never p p played this game before. I said, yeah, it's that bad, huh? He says, no, no, no. You get on that green and you look at that putt, you sink it, and there's no worries. He says, I'll guarantee you if you pick this game up, you'll not do that again because you'll start thinking about it. And I said, well, that could be well true. But, um, yeah, they, they beat us. And he, he picked up on that. He says, you were just too too relaxed on that green. He says, you'll never be that relaxed if you pick, if you pick this game up for real. So that was that was pretty interesting. That's then, very true because I don't keep score when I golf. And then that gets me to stop thinking about it. Just get out and just hit the ball, have fun. And as soon as I start, he's where I play with Ralph Furlong a lot. And he's like, after a while, he's like, come on, you got to keep score. And sure enough, there my game goes down the tank. I'm like, no, I don't want to keep score anymore. I just want to be relaxed and just hit the ball. Yeah, just hit the ball, have fun, get out there on the field, walk around. Yeah, That's the way I play golf. Ernie, yeah, I don't, don't think score either. Did you do the octathlon when we had to do the weightlifting? That was one of the things. How much could you press? Anyway, uh, I, I think it was 250. <laughs> 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 of course it was, coach. <laughs> this is what you were mentioning earlier, um, Ricky, about how these guys. You know, these coaches are just, they're so competitive. I went, we were doing the weights up in the, in, at the gym in Corundu with the weight room upstairs uh, next to each of the basketball courts. So I walk up there because it's, you know, I was going to do it that day. Sanders, Jack Sanders, Coach Sanders, he's on the bench with his underwear on. I said, hey, Coach, what's this? He said, you weigh yourself and you, you want to be as light as you can be. So that takes away 
They, they, <laughs> oh my god! <laughs> he's, he's, Three pounds, four pounds. Yeah, yeah. He's lifting that yeah. thing with his underwear, and then That's we hilarious. did. We did free throws. Moffitt shot twenty-eight out of thirty free throws. Wow! Yeah, you know Moffitt played ball in Azusa Pacific, I think it was. Okay, yeah. I didn't know that. See, I would not have pictured him for a basketball player. Well, he he did. He he did. Awesome. And Ernie, you remember the Cayucos when we did the Cayuco part yeah. of the, that program? Um, it was one team was John McGee, Kenny Anderson, and I forgot who the other two guys were. But we had to, you know, go around a couple of buoys, and when we came back, we had we had to cross between the two buoys at the end. Well, uh, Anderson's boat came to the outside of the buoy. And you know the coaches being as competitive as they were, and he, no, 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 you, you guys got to, it doesn't count. You got to back up, and you got to come through. Uh, right on, Heck yeah. So there was uh, Johnny John McGee was the skipper. He was he was steering the boat. Mm -hmm. So he, <laughs> this is hilarious. They had to back up, but of course that takes time. Then they had to put the boat through the through the two buoys, and sure. he gets up, throws a paddle on the. On the on the little island we were at, he says, "Damn, McGee, you commandeered battleships and you can't steer a." I was just gonna say he was in the navy. Come yeah. on, <laughs> you, you commandeered battleships. I will never forget that phrase. Uh, you commandeered uh, battleships. Uh, fantastic. Do you remember what year that was? What's that? Do you remember what year that was? Oh, uh, I, I we did this every year for a lot of years. A lot That's of years. Cool. One of the things we did was we ran the 400, you know, a regular 400. Another time, another year, we did it on tricycles. Can you imagine all those wow, all right. tricycles? Uh, it That's was, so Zonian. It, it was another world. But you know what? Those are those are times that I, I would never give up. It was just right. so much fun. And then we're out there running the 400 and just practicing and just practicing and practicing. Um, and I was out there with Stromberg one time, and we're, I said, you know what? This is a lot of fun. He says, yeah, it's fun until the stopwatches come out. <laughs> uh, <laughs> and there's that competitive uh, nature again. All right. That's it. That so so my, my biggest memory, well, not my biggest, I, well, a bunch of them, but Bulldogs and, and, and activities outside of actual football itself. Coach, you remember when we had to move the cage back from Balboa to Diablo? Right. We ran that thing as a team down Section I, down the road, <laughs> carrying the cage, stop traffic and everything, go all the way down the road and run into Diablo in the middle of the highway there. I'm like, that's that's the Bulldogs for you, man. One, Heck story, yeah. one story about Moffitt. I was assistant principal at Car Carundu. Dahlstrom was a principal. And then he said, Ernie, I got a, a tough job. We're not, we can't do it. You got to tell Moffitt. He's got to wear <laughs> tennis shoes because we're going to get inspected. He's got to wear tennis shoes. And he's a coach. He used to wear flip-flops to work. Oh, that's, right. I said, that's right. Wow. I said, man, that oh, okay, I'll, I'll do it. I'll go over there and, and, and tell him. So I said, I said, Moffat, let's sit down. We're going to discuss this. This is because we're going to get an inspection, okay? And and I was ordered from top to tell you that when the inspection comes, you got to wear tennis shoes. So he got he, he blew his stack, right? <laughs> <laughs> so Surely not. It's, it's got to be tomorrow. You got to wear tennis shoes tomorrow. All right, I wear them. I wear them. I don't like it, but uh, next morning. <laughs> He wears tennis shoes, but backwards. In other words, <laughs> the right shoe was on the left. <laughs> and, and here comes here come these people from Washington or all over the place. And there he is, standing up right there. You told me to wear shirt, tennis shoes. I'm wearing them. But the, right the, directions. Was on the left and the left was on the right. And, and I, I shook my head. And Dawson looked at me and he said, well, I, I told him to wear tennis shoes. He's wearing tennis shoes. You didn't I'll give them in the right direction. Instructions. Talk to 
later on. <laughs> Moffat's dress, his dress attire were the gym shorts, the t-shirt, and the flip-flops. And I'm talking even at the end of year functions when everybody was dressed real nice. That was Moffat's um, standard operating procedure. Oh, that's fantastic. That's a, that's a man that stays true to himself. Have you heard from him anymore? No, I haven't. I really haven't. <laughs> anybody in the audience, have you heard from Coach yes, Moffitt? Throw it out in the, in the chat. If anybody yeah. knows where Coach Moffitt is, let us know. Put it in the chat. Uh, maybe the 2014 reunion he was there, I, I want to say, because I, I remember seeing him there. No, okay. he's been to the reunion on a, a few times. A few times, I'm right. I'll have to yeah. look him up. Well, did we have you, to get him on the show here and find out what the story is if he's still wearing flip flops. Just to mention, <laughs> did you guys ever read that article from Sports Illustrated in 1991? Um, he was he, there was an article on him. Really, and it is incredible, incredible. He he indicates on that Moffat is just he, he, he's another another type of human being. He has been to every. Major League Baseball, mate, um, NFL, hockey, NBA, basketball. Wow! In every, in every, what a cool story! Every single one of them, every single That's one amazing. of them. He has, he has been to the majority of the college venues. He's even been to high school baseball games. And wow. he has, that says he was. Um, he just does things in such an, an unusual way. He, he wears nothing. He just got those gym shorts and the t-shirt, and that's about you, all you'd see him in. He does Who's his thing. Window? He was. He went to visit him up in Wisconsin, where over the summer when when Ron was there, and he says they were. It was pouring rain, so they. Buffett didn't have anything on him. It didn't look like it, but he says you know go in and change. He goes into the room he's staying at. He. He opens the door to give something to Moffitt, and he says he's got dollar bills in 20s, in 50s, in 100s, soaking wet, lying on the bed. Ron says, <laughs> how was he carrying those things? But they, he, they were soaking wet, but he was drying them out on the bed. So <laughs> Moffitt just, he, he, he just mentions, he mentions something, and he's got a story about it. And it, it's just the other one was um, Bougier. Well, apparently, was, he's in Hawaii. Is what Pedro yeah. Penalver said. He's in Hawaii. Yeah, he was. He went back out there. I think that's where he is. I think so that's that where was, he is. That was one of Louis' assistant coaches. Yeah. But he's still, yeah. he's still, he's still one. <laughs> 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 no, he it, Ernie on the sideline. This is so funny. He's out there with his gym shorts, the T-shirts, and the flip-flops. This is on a football game. It starts to rain. Everybody pulls out their umbrella. You look over to the sideline. Moffitt's got, you know, those little hat umbrellas? Of course. That's what he was wearing. <laughs> That's what he was wearing, one of those little hat umbrellas. And everybody's got their big umbrellas on, but no, he's just standing like it's a beautiful sunny day with that, that little umbrella hat. Water streaming down off it, but not not batting an eye, not batting That's an hilarious. eye. That's hilarious, and it it's absolutely fits with that, that his whole persona. That pretty much is 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 him to a T. Hey Ernie, did they ever figure out? Did they ever figure out Bouzier's question? Who was the shortest? Henry Barker, Mike Weed, or Doctor Wolf? Did they ever figure out at one of the big? End of year. Thing. I would say weed, weed. He was the 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 shop the shop teacher, right? Yes, yes he was. Yes, I would say him. He was the shorty one. Well, it was close. It was. It was close. close. Bouzier had the three of them come up on on the stage for his retirement, <laughs> for his retirement, <laughs> so that there could be a, a, a finalized consensus as to who who was the shortest. And I, I never I never heard of it. I, I never heard what the final. The, the final edition. What the verdict story. was. Uh, yeah. The final edition of that story. Uh, Bouzier had a lot to do with uh, my, my architectural career. He was the, he taught me drafting eighth grade, and till today I haven't stopped. <laughs> yeah, that's right. That's right. Yeah. 
That's eighth right. grade. I remember he was uh, well, he, I mean, he well -dresser. That's, I mean, he well-dressed her. I remember that distinctively, how he would dress so sharp on a daily base. But, yeah, oh, I remember him. He was an important man in my life, too, Mr. Bouzier. Yeah, well, he was important. I haven't enough. heard much from Bouzier. What, what's the deal with him? I don't know. The last I heard, he was not doing very well. Um, Is he still I'll find out from his son. I talk to his son all the time. I'll find out from him. Yeah, please do, because I, I haven't. I have, I, in fact, the last <clears> time <throat> Everett White went down, he says he couldn't, he couldn't find out, because Everett would go and see him. Every time he'd go down. Somebody but, told me uh, he was in a wheelchair. Is that right? Yes, he was. Yes, he was. Let and me message his son and see what he, he said. When anyway. they go down there, they take him to all these guys meet up and they have a lunch. They go somewhere for lunch. And every time they had a chance, they'd, they'd go and pick him up, take him in the wheelchair and have lunch with play. him. You couldn't play basketball with him because if he got the ball, he shot. <laughs> 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 he never passed the ball. That is true. Uh, uh, that, no, don't throw the ball to Bougie because he's going to shoot uh, it. That is true, man. The 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 guy from from Wisconsin with the crinkly hairs. That was That's fantastic. But you know what? The, the, those those years in the Canal Zone schools, it's they just they embed into your psyche, mm -hmm. and you just you know. I am what I am, and that's all that I am. So that's what you know. Popeye said that. That's a Popeyeism. Right. <laughs> but we are the result of having lived that experience. You know, tackle Agreed. football started in in the Canal Zone, nineteen forty eight. No, 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 no. Before that, yeah. no, 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 you're right. Nineteen forty eight is when they used pads for the pads first time. For, yes. Yes. Yes, you're right. You're right and about that. Coach. That goes back. And, you know, there are, there are stories that, that keep coming up. Look, I graduated from Babel High School in 1967. For the, one of the reunions, they asked if I could say a few things about Babel. So I got up there and started talking. I said, let me ask you a question. How many times did we beat Christopher? Oh, we beat him twice. We beat him. I said, let me tell you the truth. In my four years of high school, we never beat Christopher one time. <laughs> so that was a story for a lot of people up until until you when when some of you guys got involved and started coaching. Yeah, you missed that. You, you missed that part of the podcast, Coach Houston. Yeah. One of the reasons hey. Coach Allen got his job was we're not supposed to tell anybody, and we promised we would it, but it's out. Here we are. Was that uh, Bulldogs couldn't beat Carl, uh, Cristobal for many years? We we couldn't. We we couldn't. And we had we had decent teams, but, but they ran they ran a five three, and that's easy to block, but nobody could figure it out. Linton, that's what he ran, and uh, uh, then Louis started running something else and uh, attacking, pulling guards and pulling tackles and stuff. That's how you beat it. But uh, after that, you know, we started beating them pretty bad. But like did his son, wasn't his son a quarterback? I remember there was a Linton quarterback from Cristo that was really good. Okay. Um, Oren Clement was one. The other one was um, um, Patton, Neil Patton. Right, right. But Oren Clement was the tops. He was a little, little guy. But he was tops. We played Cristobal on our field my junior year. And we were beating them seven oh, six zero. And on the last play of the game, Jack Blair was in the end zone with two of our defenders on the last play. And he jumped up and caught the pass, came down, they kicked the extra point, and they beat us seven six. I went into that dressing room and cried and cried but, because we had never come close to beating them like that. Sure. And, and you were one play away from it. We were one play away from it. But I can remember playing a defensive end against Cristobal. Leo Paulson as a fullback. Leo was a guard, but he was like a like a bowling ball. He was their fullback. <laughs> Behind him was our arch enemy, Jack Sanders. 
Jack was such an incredible football player and playing a defensive end, they would pull their guards. Um, they pulled both their guards and they would use that student body sweep with the guards pulling. And here comes Leo Paulson leading the way. And my job as a defensive end was to strip the interference. Well, it wasn't stripping the interference. It was getting bowled over. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Leo, Leo and I are real good friends today. But back then, oh, I hated that play. I hated that play with a passion. And then Sanders would come along behind him with his little moves. And because Sanders had a lot of speed. Sanders was a tremendous football player. But they had they had some great teams back yeah. in the in the mid 60s. And we just couldn't keep up with them. We couldn't keep up with them in four years. We never beat them one time. That's a yeah. dubious record. Yeah, no, well, you weren't alone, though. I mean, they were dominant, you know, early on. And then the Atlantic side was a much more prominent area in the zone back then. It, it you know, started to fade away, and, and pretty soon the Pacific side became the the more dominant one. But, you know, a lot of people grew up down there, and, and it was. It was a dominant program. I always, I always looked at that as a, you know, you didn't have a lot of scouting on them, I guess. And for us as players, we knew even less, right? We knew about all the other four teams around us, the Cougars, the Green Devils, the Red Machine. But, you know, what we knew about Cristobal was just some stats, you know, and, and we hadn't gotten there to play them or they hadn't showed up to play us yet. So, you know, it, for us, it was kind of an unknown. And I guess for you guys, like you said, you you knew what they were running. You knew they ran that 5-3. You know, we, as, as players, we didn't look at all that stuff. And, and so they were just, you know, for us, it was a legendary team that still had that pedigree, you know, and, and we kind of, Respected that. Yeah, they Until were the first quarter, and they were like, they were okay, we were in the late seventies and the early eighties, like you know, when my, my time when I was playing ball, they were they were competitive. They they wouldn't win, but they were still a good team. Yeah, I, I can remember Overstreet and Eggers. Pardon, coach. No, I can remember those times as well. They were, yeah. like you say, they would they could stay on the field with you, but they weren't dominant, not at all. No. No, no once they started players. losing, once you guys elevated your game on the Pacific side, I think that was kind of the beginning of the end for them. Right. Yeah, they I don't think they ever recovered from that. You, coaches, you guys remember Leo Barker? Remember yes. he, he made it up, he made it to the NFL, he played in the Super Bowl. That was, I think, the last year that they were like really dominant. And that was must have been like 77, 78, maybe, or 76. No, nah, 76 red machine one. Yeah. I'm trying to think of what year the years, man. They just go by. They go by, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, Coach Sweeney said us that it's like four pages of history, and you know I've been reading it, but I don't don't remember it all. And in it, he has all the years and all the uh, 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 the players. Maybe we'll forward that to you guys for the next for the next time we get together. Yeah, for sure. And so let me ask you this, Co and Coach Holland, you first. What was your favorite play on offense? What you would consider your go-to play? Um, it was funny. We were running the veer at the beginning when I, when we came from when I came from Texas because Houston was running it. Yeah, they, they were top. We're running the veer, but then uh, then uh, then uh, USC was running the I formation. Those were the two major, major offenses that that were in the United States, and uh, I would change from from the veer to to the the I formation. There, there was one one play off of the I formation that I like to run, uh, which would be on the six hole, the A B C gap, and uh, we had some real good runners at that time. Uh, especially when the when the black schools merged with Balboa Winters, there was some a lot of speed and oh, yeah 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 Winters you could, you, could, you could run the you could run the I formation better than you could the beer and uh, uh, we had Gina Winters and all those guys you know they were excellent runners and. Uh, and we would beat Cristobal with the eye. Uh, and it was uh, probably the, the 26th. But we ran, it, we ran it very, 
uh, very uh, very effectively. Effectively, sure. And that was probably the best play we had in, in those days. The sure. Beer later, I mean earlier, and then we re I would switch from one to the other, and the but the re was a uh, was the beer was a a replay. All right, yep. you gave right. or you gave. If you keep, you gave or you keep. You know that was, was much harder to teach. Yeah, we had three reads on that play, right? The guard, I mean, the, the inside tag, the defensive tackle what was the first read. Then the defensive end was the next read. Right. And then, yeah, and then the corner. You know, the corner. The corner. Right, right. And, and I used to, my favorite was, because I played tight end, was that smash pass. Because I would kind of loop that out in the flats and then come around down the sidelines. And, and I was often with a linebacker who, by the time they, they picked me up, I was already two or three steps ahead of him. So that was... Right. Uh, we we got a lot of good yardage on that play. I always loved that when I, when I hear a smash pass right off, like okay, because Julio would always throw the ball to me. Him and I were were were, were tight, so I, I knew I was getting the ball on those plays. That it was that made it fun for me. Coach Houston, what about you? What was your your go to play? Um, without a doubt, it was that forty four isolation. I just stayed with the eye for two reasons. Number one, I of all the the reading that I did, that was the the one that I felt the most comfortable with. Um, also, it was our bread and butter. If everything else went south, I knew we could run that 44 isolation. And one year when I had a problem with the quarterback, one year, yeah, but I had a problem with the quarterback, coming late to practice, I said, son, you show up late one more time and you're not playing Friday night. Well, she came late the next day, you're not playing. You see that side of the college there? On that, go sit there. That's what you're going to be doing the rest of this practice and the rest of this week. The, kid, the kids, man, coach, you can't do it. We only had one quarterback, and that was him. I said, well, what we'll do is this. Coach, I think we started the Wildcat before it was ever run in the pros or in college. Nice. When I took the fullback, moved them to one side, had the center direct snap back to the tailback, and we could run everything 44 Isolation, 44 counter, um, 43, 42, 41, 44 sweep. We, we could run everything without the quarterback handing the ball off. It was just a direct snap to the tailback. And the tailback I had was a kid from Cristobal. I can't remember his name right now, but he was really, really a horse to bring down. And um, he, was a, he, he was a heck of a ball player. And we did really well with that. So we would put it in from time to time. But that was, it was just so easy to run. Right. It just becomes so automatic. That you, you know, anybody can step in there and That's have a good idea of how to run it. Because we had to do a lot of jumping around in positions. And right. that was, that had to be our bread and butter. Everyone had to know what to do on that play. And um, one time we called, that was when you could go out to the field. We called right. a timeout and I ran out there and, I said, look, what we're gonna do is we're gonna put, we're gonna run that 44 isolation. And I'm, I'm saying this loudly. And the defense that they were playing against, they're looking at me like it was against the red. And they're looking at me like, you know, he's not, they're not gonna run that. And I, look, you, you block, you're the guard, you take that guy, you do, you this, you this, you do. And I'm pointing. And <laughs> now let's run that. And they were saying, they're not gonna run that. Don't worry about it. Well, we did. I went out there and gave, Individual instructions to, you know, I just got so, so frustrated, but it, it worked. We, we won that game, not necessarily on that play, but we, we did win that game. That game. So it was just, it was so much fun, so much fun. And coaches, no, oh, sorry, go ahead. No, it's because they, you, you, those kids, you don't know if what you're saying or doing ever sinks in, but I'll tell you right. what, going to that reunion, and getting together with all those guys, they're not kids anymore, man. In fact, these, some of them are even telling me, what are you doing? Well, I'm retired. Wait, 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 wait. You can't be retired. You can't be retired. Yeah, we're getting close, coach. Well, but you, you can't ever let those those years go. You can't let those times go. You, you can't relive them, but they're with you forever. All right. Speaking of that, speaking of that, I'm not letting it go. You two guys had an epic football game in '79, I believe. 
And I remember, I don't know what happened in the field. I don't know if you guys remember this, but Coach Holland, you were so upset that you pulled everybody off the field. I think it was like a bad call or – you guys remember that game? Yeah, yeah, I remember that. I remember that. Yeah, there was – at that time, they had some new new officials. Yes. yes. And uh, were, they were not uh, interpreting the rule correctly. And I mentioned it to him several times, and I said, "Look, you you can't do that. That, that that's illegal. That it's, it's not in the rule book. Why are you calling it?" And the guy said, I'm, "You're going to get 15 yard penalty <laughs> threats." And I said, "And it was only a few minutes left, though, left, you know." And I said, "Right, right. Okay, look, I'm telling you, you that you're." interpreting the rule differently you can't do that but he came back and said you got another one yeah yeah geez. i, I remember said, that fine i i give up we, we we went and i said let's go and i had some crazy i had some crazy players there i had uh, <laughs> john morris, morris john, john morris, morris. and yeah, he was ready to fight the official okay. <laughs> <laughs> and he said coach i'm gonna go after him i want to go after I said, no, yeah. we're all <laughs> going to go away. We're just gone. And then, we're out of here. And there was only about two, three minutes left. Oh, cool, so, there were 15 seconds. Or 15 yeah, yeah, I remember that the very, very end. I do remember in that fact, game. And, and then, but but I, none of us, nobody in the stands. I had some crazy kids that were ready to jump with the official. And I said, if you jump with <laughs> the official, you guys won't be able to play problem. anymore. Right. So, right. So I took them out, took them out, and then the next day, uh, bon Duren called me in the office yeah. and he said, you know, you're not supposed to do that. I got a call from the officials and whatever. And I said, look, we would have had a riot on our hands. I had several players that are not normal. Okay, Johnny Moore. <laughs> was, was hey, really he's not kidding. Up. He is not kidding. <laughs> and I, and oh, I love it. I had, I had several other guys that were going to jump on the official. And I said I had I had to get it I had to get him out, okay, and and I said get out of here get out of here, so uh, we walked out, and uh, yeah. and that was that was crazy, it was a it rule. was it was, it was I remember rule. everybody saw the saw what nobody nobody knows what happened I think until today nobody knows this is why I wanted to ask the question, well, but we all remember that we, we all remember that but nobody knew what had happened. I'll give you the rest of the story. Oh, right. There were 15 seconds left. It was our ball. And the referee tells me, he says, you've got to snap the ball for the game to end. So I, I just screamed on the field, just snap the ball. Snap the ball and run. Just run it to the end zone. Just snap. The I was going ballistic. <laughs> just snap the ball. So I re remember who the quarterback was, but here's what he did. He took the snap. Edgar, Edgar was your quarterback. Okay. He took the snap and gave it to the guard which you can do, but the guard has to reverse. He's got to face his own end zone. He didn't. He just took the ball and ran it into the end zone. The referees, no touchdown. The game is over. So I said, you know what? We just rewrote football history. We were on the field with no defense and couldn't score. <laughs> <laughs> but if I remember it right, didn't Johnny Morris chase that guy out into the end zone and tackle them, like, close to the end zone or something like that? I don't know about that, but I don't know. Uh, yeah, I don't no. know. There was no defense on the field, and we could not score. That's how bad we were. <laughs> wow. The, pro the problem was I tried to stop a, a madness there. A riot. A riot. No, no. I Coach, told I understood what you heard. I you said, you were, you were going to have a, a total disaster. The officials would have been coming out of, out of there all bloody. So especially with John oh, Moore and, and that bunch there. No, no I crazy, knew crazy what you were part. doing. What? In fact, I mentioned it to my to my coaches. I said, "Look, what Ernie just did is he is putting out a fire. That's what he's doing. He's putting out a fire." And I remember yeah. speaking to to Paul Williams about that. I said, "What Ernie just did is he put out a fire." Yeah, yeah. So I told was, my parents that, and I said, "You know, I would probably do it again." I yeah. said, I wasn't, I wasn't scared of, of the, the players fighting each other. 
the players were going to go out to the officials. Yeah, and that's you can't do that. That's 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 a deal breaker there. Right, you, you know, guys had you to gotta respect the officials. That, I remember yeah. that Paul Williams, because Paul was and I talk about this. You know how we were talking about how we, you guys would uh, make up plays right there on the field. The play that you coach, you guys beat uh, Houston's team was like that. Was for Paul, the way Paul says it that he made up the play in the in the huddle. <laughs> And uh, and then they, they threw the uh, touchdown pass to Morgan, the tight end, up the middle. Yeah, yeah. I don't know if you guys remember that's the play, but that was the second game you guys played, and it was again was a close game to the end. Yeah, street was, side football, right up the middle. Yeah, right. Yeah, and tight end up the middle. It. Do you think that doesn't happen at the top level of football? Oh, I'm yeah. sure. Absolutely. The quarterback will tell the guy, "Okay, you do this," and it may not be in the playbook. But it is done. You know right. it because you're out there. You know, you do so many things. One of the things that I will never, ever forget, we were on the covered stand side. The, the, the stands are behind right. The home yeah, side. Yeah. The cheerleaders had laid their, um, from the other team, okay, had laid their pom-poms in a kind of right. hat. And I'm walking up and down, and I'm tripping over these pom-poms. And I get, girls, get these things out of here. Back, back them up. So... You know, they, they did it. Next thing you know, they're back where they were. I'm walking by again. I trip over the pom-poms. I turned and started kicking pom-poms. <laughs> it looked like like explosions. <laughs> and I'm kicking the pom-poms towards the bleachers and, you know, towards the parents. They're probably saying, this guy's really lost it. Yeah, see, in, today, in today's world, that would be reported as coach loses his mind and attacks cheerleaders. And there you are in the video kicking pom-poms everywhere. But, I mean, I kicked those pom poms out onto the track, away from the side. <laughs> it was just—I will never ever forget. I bet that. they never did that again. The I bet out. they never put the pom poms. <laughs> <laughs> they got the hit. So you know, I can so, understand. So real quick, guys, um, we were talking about Mr. Bouzier uh, earlier, and I messaged Dirksen, and so he he uh, messaged and and told he's he's not doing well health wise, as, as right. he mentioned there. Um, uh, Dirksen mentioned that. Um, He's he's bedridden, has um, brain damage uh, from a stroke that he had. Right. So uh, and, and Dirk's taking taking care of him. So he just wanted to mention that. I mentioned that we were talking about him, and so we give him give him regards. So everybody, prayer there for the Bouzier family. That uh, you know, what they're. Oh yeah. Uh, no, oh, he looks so great. Like yeah. That is, but, is that, that, I mean, that's but he's got that smile, table. right? He's still got that same look and that smile. Yeah, you know? it looks like he's got his drafting table. Yeah. Yeah. He was so, a super, super person, super person. Yeah, for sure, for sure. So, but anyway, Dirk, I appreciate you, Dirksen, providing us that that information. It's uh, good to know that he's that he's still with us, and our prayers go out to him and the family. So, but uh, looks like Coach Houston may have uh, hit some technical glitches here. But, yeah, um, I did. Listen, um, Coach Holland, I'm. You know, we've been on here for a long time, uh, so we're getting ready to, to end the show. But first of all, I, I want to ask you to please come back again. I would love to have more conversations with you. Uh, I'd love to have a show on the Bulldogs and just talk Bulldogs history, you know, talk about some of our seasons and what we did. Because to, to me, those are just amazing, amazing memories. And and, and I'm, I'm very grateful to have played for, for you. Uh, um, the funny story, you talk about how you, how you handle – situations you know like that when putting out fires and stuff and when you were principal um there was a couple times when i got in a little bit of trouble and i'd go to the office there and surely not and i'd sit there and i'm like i'm thinking oh my gosh um i gotta sit here with coach coach uh holland and and i'd sit in that office and you wouldn't say a word you just sit there doing your work and after about 20 30 minutes you'd look up and be like we good yes sir all right don't do it again yes sir <laughs> and that was it i'd walk out i was like Right. I'm thinking about wow, no, no dressing down, yelling, but but the entire time I was sitting there scared to death, man. I was like, oh, coach is pissed. Right. This isn't good. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> so, well, you, you do. Okay. yeah good. no, good but it was a great way of handling things. You know, it was you know you, you did things your way, and and we got the hint. We knew what what you meant there. A lot of times that silence was probably worse than the dressing down. And so, trust me, it worked, coach. <laughs> I got the message. <laughs> One of my perks by being your quarterback was you gave me you allowed me to have two gym classes my senior year. Yeah, yeah. Uh, right on. 
<laughs> so I after 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 like lunch, I had just fifth and six. I would just go hang out with coach and you know that, that was it. I had two gym classes. Keep you away from those girls. Keep me away from <laughs> East Adams. <laughs> Okay. Well, coach, listen, Coach, we've been on three hours, and I, we really, really, really appreciate you coming on. You're a legend. You, you know, you're very inspirational to so many of us. Um, uh, again, thank you so much, Coach, and we really hope to see you again. If you're in yeah. time, I'll come by and see me. Absolutely, Coach. I, I will. I absolutely right. will. Um, thank, you for thank you so much, and thank you, uh, Eric, uh, for helping uh, facilitate this for your dad. And again, Coach, happy belated birthday. Everybody, if you just joined us, uh, yesterday was Coach Holland's birthday, so wish him a happy birthday. Throw it in the chat and everything. But, Coach, you, you've you absolutely made my day here coming on the air. I, I really, really appreciate you. Great seeing you again after all these years, and, and you know, I've I, I have not ever forgotten any of the lessons you taught me. Even when I coached, I look back and, you know, had Coach Holland do this, and I hopefully I was able to emulate some of what you did. But um, I'm always very grateful for, for everything you did for me. And, and Thank you for everything. I just hope that uh, baby Jesus will give me about three or four more years. I hope. Or, or a lot more, Coach, or a lot more. But yeah, we're hoping you, for a lot for more. the history of All football right. in the Canal Zone. Thank All you right. so much, Coach. See you later. Good evening. Take care, Coach. Eric, thanks so much. We'll talk to you later. All right, thanks. Yep, take care. Coach Houston, I don't know if you can still hear us or not. Um, let me see here. Yeah, I don't think. Uh, yeah, I think we yeah, lost you. Okay. Well, cool. we'll have another, another phenomenal. Oh, this was a great one, man. This was a great one. Legendary coaches. Those, those gentlemen deserved all the time they took, but it was our longest show, Willie. Three hours. That's amazing. That's absolutely That's amazing. incredible. It didn't even seem like it, man. It just it was just a good time. But um, yeah, I just that that, that was really special to me. You know, very special. Um, yeah. I remember when I when I uh got to interview for the first time Coach Cotton last year, and of course he came on again here. But those are those you know, there's certain people that are special in your life, and, and you know, for me, football was a big deal for me, and 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 those guys really really made a big, big impact on my life, not just in football, you know? Yeah. I mean, life little, lessons. Well, the shout out, everybody participated again. We we're really yes. grateful for that. A lot of football players, a lot of the girls, everybody. You guys, we love you so much for being a part of this. You guys make this yeah. such, so much fun, so much. You have no idea how great this is and how, how Willie and I really appreciate all you guys participating. Thanks once again, man, really, guys. Yeah, I know it is. Uh, it's a lot of fun. Um, yeah. Next week, we're going to have, like I said, uh, Laura Kostick is going to come on and speak on behalf of the uh, of the society. They've got some announcements and things going on there and an opportunity for you guys to ask questions and and get to know the society, get to know everything they do. So you really get behind them and follow them because, yeah, you know, our to... canal zone is it ended in 1999, but it's still near and dear to our hearts. And, and these guys at the society are the ones that keep that going. So give back to the society make sure you stay involved with them um you know we're gonna have again uh paul williams was on earlier tonight subbing in paul i know you're not you're not here right now but uh great job subbing in man last minute uh you know backup awesome. quarterback yeah. stepped in and, and, and yeah absolutely took care of things so it was awesome uh again like you said ricky a lot of participation from the audience we really really like that stuff Anybody here that is uh, any of the graduating classes, reach out to a couple of your classmates. Put together a group of four. We're looking for contestants for our Canal Zone Feud show. It's going to be a lot of fun. We're going to be talking, you know, asking questions and trivia about the Canal Zone. So it'll be a really, really cool, fun show to do. If you want to join us and you want to get involved, set your team up. Let us know about it, and, and we'll get you guys set up and, and kick this off. Carlos had about just messaged me. Uh, he donated some shirts and some stuff uh, for the uh, for that show. He's going to be at the at the reunion at the, in the vendors there, so make sure you stop by and see him. He's got some really cool shirts and stuff that he's always selling at the reunion. Uh, Cassie Sprague agreed to throw some stuff in from Al Sprague from Panama Art, and so uh, and Ruthie MacArthur Balboa Trading Company. So it's going to be some really cool swag there for you guys. Get involved. Have a lot of fun. Keep the, the Canal Zone stories and legends and memories going and, and, and just have a lot of fun with this, guys.
Seriously. Yep. And, and before we go, guys out there, Willie and I are going to do a show. If I'm not next week, the following week, it's just going to be him and I, no guests. And we're going to, again, talk about the Canal Zone life. We want to get you guys all involved on all the games we played, all the girlfriends, boyfriends we had. And that's going to be the, the our show coming up. And we're going to try to do it at least once every eight weeks. And then recap all the other, you know, all the guests we've had on and uh, that kind of stuff. So it's going to be a lot of fun, too. Just Will and I and you guys sharing our, our yeah. canal one way. Yeah, no guests. You guys will be the guests on that show. That's Throw correct. some good topics. You bring up a topic. Let's talk about it and, and, and exchange some stories, some memories. How about, Willie, if we do like a call-in? What do you think of that? If people can call There might be a way of doing that. Either that or if, if somebody wants to get on the air, we can get you on the air pretty quick. I mean, in the middle of this show, I, I sent Coach Houston the link to join up and, and he was able to pop in. So it's not hard to do. It's really actually very simple. I send you a link. You go on the, your phone, your computer, click on it, accept the mic and the camera to turn on, and that's it. We take yep. care of the rest. It's, it's really cool. Yeah. But, um, yeah, we want to make this show about you guys because at the end of the day, um, you guys are what makes this show a lot of fun. Absolutely. Ricky and I can only say so much, but – a lot of it comes from what you guys are commenting on the screen and asking questions and engaging. So definitely keep that up. Devin, real quick, you threw a a, a, a uh, link in there. What is this for? VaultSI.com. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, cool. Right on. Hell yeah. Martin rode from, I saw that he had per, uh, put it up earlier. He rode his bike from, Devin, is that from Florida to Seattle or something like that? Cool. That's awesome, man. Yeah. yeah, he'll pop in here in a second. He'll he'll confirm it. But um, yeah, that's awesome. Well, well done. This is listen. If you guys want to uh, connect to somebody or do something, um, let us know. This is the place to do it, right? This is the place where we can reach out to people. Again, you know, Dirks and Bouzier, appreciate you talking about sharing that information about your dad and prayers to you and your dad and, and everybody. Um, God bless you for taking care of him. Um, and and again, you know, this is we're all a big family here. Right. We all share in all the laughs, all the fun and all the great things, but we also support each other and help out. And so um, that's that's part of what we do as Zonians here. Uh, great stuff. Again, Ricky, a fantastic show. Um, was awesome. Really, really good stuff. Any ideas you guys have for future shows on the ladies side? I know that we don't throw a lot of stuff out there for the girls, but we do have a Rams cheer show in the works. There's a lot of other stuff out there. If you guys anything you guys want to put out there. Same thing with the Atlantic side. I'm supposed to, I was supposed to talk to uh, David Cohen last week, and I unfortunately I was tied up with uh, with Panama Lacrosse. They were in Orlando for a for a training camp that I had to go and, and do some stuff there. Um, but I'll probably try and reach out to him if you're on the air here, David. I'll try and reach out to you tomorrow, and we want to get a Atlantic side component to this show as well because a lot of this is pretty much geared to the Pacific side, and right, we still have another half of that country to go. So. Um, All right, but well, that's what I got, man. Ricky, what else you got? Anything anything to close out with? No, other than my being very grateful and thankful. We're good. It's time to awesome. check out. Fantastic, fantastic meeting. Guys, share the links. Remember on Facebook, uh, SCN, facebook.com slash SCN Canal Zone. On YouTube, if you're on the channel there, share it with any of our friends and family that are not on Facebook. Share the YouTube link. They can join the show there. I did see quite a few people on here chiming in through YouTube, so it was really cool to see. Um, keep the keep the channel growing. Spread the love, guys. Let's get a lot more people on here. Um, any of the people that are on sponsoring or, or helping us out, Las Cascadas with Andrew Eftemitis in Panama, uh, Jerry Curtis's motorcycle uh, group, if you want to go and do something down there, check that one out. Of course, Panama Arts, Al Sprague, that wonderful Panama and Canal Zone art. So, Make sure you, you give these people the love and, and, and help their businesses to grow and flourish and help the Panama Canal story go. So All right. I'm good on my end. Jill, thank you for participating. Love to have you guys on here. Um, that's all I got, Ricky. Muchas gracias, hermano. Abrazos. Thank you. All right, Canazo, cheers. All right, guys, cheers.